G. Marshall. Welcome to the sounds of suspense, to the fear you can hear. Welcome to the world of nightmarish probability, where the icy fear of the unknown can lead one down strange and terrifying paths. In our story, Alex Harper confronts the impossible, and the encounter produces a devastating effect. It's Ace, our dog. He's dead, guy. Uh... I see him, Alex. There isn't a mark on him. Nothing. Look at his face. Oh, it's horrible. If I didn't know better, I'd say that something scared that pup to death. Our mystery drama, The Edge of Death was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Saul Panitz and stars Patrick O'Neill. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Meet Alex Harper farmer. Right now his left arm is in a sling, heavily bandaged to protect the more than 20 stitches. Just a small accident on his tractor. First time in his 28 years as a farmer that he'd ever suffered more than a slight sprain or a minor bruise. It is a late August morning, an unreal sky, so blue it almost hurts the eyes to look at it. Even now, there is a promise that the cool dampness of the morning will soon yield to the stifling heat of the prairie sun. No matter what you say, I still don't think I ought to leave you alone. Who said I'm alone? You hear what Judy said, huh, Ace? Oh. <laughs> Can't you be serious for a second? Oh, because I think you should go. Now, we've been over this a dozen times. If something was to happen, I'd never forgive myself. Oh, what if, what if, what if the sky fell down, chicken little? Well, your arm, it hurts, doesn't it? Did I say so? Oh, whenever you get this way, sarcastic, you're covering up. You can't fool me. Take another pill. Another one and I'll be going around like a zombie. Oh, and I'll ask Doc Stevenson if he can give you something else. But I don't want something else. Now, you go on, get your annual checkup, do a little shopping if you like. But I still think I ought to be here. After last night. Oh, boy, last night. Last night I again. I am not a hysterical woman. I didn't say you were. Well, you thought so. Well, you get me up. I have a sound sleep and insist that there are lights and noises. No, I heard something last night. It wasn't a rabbit or a deer. It was a, a flashing light. <laughs> I'm not an idiot, and I haven't got that good imagination to make it all up. And now I'll go. Ace, where are you? Come on, boy. Now I'm in no mood to play games. All right, I'm going back to the house. Oh, oh behind the barn, eh? What you got cornered, a ten-foot rabbit? Or... Oh, there you are. Now, hey, hey, you did find something. I'm, I'm coming, Ace. All right, now, bring it to me. Come on, boy, give it here. Give it here, that's it. Good dog. <laughs> hey, let's see what you discovered. Hmm, a bag. Looks just like a... Like Doc Stevenson's bag, only that couldn't be his. This one's shiny new. It feels funny. It's not leather. It doesn't feel like vinyl either. How the deuce can anyone possibly use this? No lock, no zipper, no buckle. No way to open this case. It's a gag. I'll bet that well, some of those college kids from town, sure, that's it. Judy did hear some sounds last night. The kids. And they left this. <laughs> Stupid. Well, 
Now, of course, Ace. Now, you'll get full credit. Yes, sir, boy. I'll tell Judy you found it. Now, come on. Let's, let's go back to the house. Come on. That's you, Alex? Doc, hello. How's the arm? Not bad. Now, when are you going to take the stitches out? One of these days. Now, don't rush it. That's a mighty bad tear. Will you level with me? Shoot. Well, well, will the arm be as good as new? Well, not really. Some of the muscles were torn. Oh, you'll have movement. But there will be limitations. You were lucky that it's the left and not the right. Yeah, lucky. And you'll end up with a beautiful scar. Say, Doc, is Judy still there? Uh, she left about 30 minutes ago. Did she check out okay? Well, there, uh, there are some tests that will take a few days. But from what you could see... Well, that's the real reason I called, Alex. There... There, there is something? There is. Well, not serious. Yes and no. Oh, what the devil does that mean? Well, it's your heart. And, and before you jump to conclusions, listen. If she watches herself, obeys a special diet, there's no reason why she shouldn't live a normal span of life. Did... Did you tell her? Well, only that it's a rather common condition that can be controlled. She's not alarmed, and she needn't be. Now, I mean this, Alex. I've seen patients like her do almost everything they used to do and go on and on. Almost. Oh, uh, Doc, last time you dropped by, let, let's see, that must have been at least a week ago. No more like ten days. By any chance, did you, did you leave something out here? Huh? You aren't missing one of your black bags. Huh. I've only got one bag. What are you talking about? Uh, nothing, nothing. Doc, I think I hear Judy. Yeah, yeah, it is. Hey, she's driving kind of funny. I, I better hang up, Doc. Oh, Alex! Oh, oh easy oh, now. Whatever it is, you're home. I, I'm so frightened. I, I, oh, it's sure. Just a, a few miles past the Clearwood Sanitarium. You know the big curve through the woods. Yeah, yeah. I slowed down. Uh, well, would you rather talk about it a little later? You're, you're shaking all over. Now, come on inside, Judy. I'll, I'll make some tea. Come on. Yes, yes, like that. Inside. With the walls around me. Oh, Alex. Yes? We're in danger, Alex. Oh, now, Judy. I saw him. I tell you, I saw him. Who? Death. Alex. I saw death. <laughs> You feel better now? Yes. Look, I can hold my hands out and they don't shake anymore. That may be hard to call the doc anyway. I, I guess you must think I've... Oh, Alex. I was maybe a minute or so past the railroad bridge when I heard this thing. What thing? It was on the news. About a patient at Clearwood escaping. And, and you know, please notify if you see him and telephone number and all. Any description? Well, all I can remember was something about his being dressed all in black. Nothing more. Hear that? What? Siren, police siren. Why, well, it could be a fire truck. Oh, yes, I suppose so. You've heard sirens before. Yes, I know, but... I know, but... But they're searching for him. I still don't know who him is, except he's one of those mental cases from Clearwood. Well, he was just standing by the side of the road. But first I could barely see him in the shadows, dressed in black as he was. Well, what'd he do? Nothing. Just stood there, looking. Didn't threaten you? And then he said something. It, it was like, I want to communicate with you. Yes, I think that was it. And you got out of there fast. Did he shout? No. His voice was soft and, and mild. And he said, communicate? You sure he used that word? Communicate, yes. It's a queer word to use, don't you think? I mean, most people would say talk. I want to talk with you. Communicate. I, I mean, I know what I heard. I looked up when I heard him, and... And by now he was in the sunlight, and... I could see him clearly, just a few feet away. <laughs> Alex... He had no face. Now, Judy. I know what I saw. There was no face. 
I'm not hysterical, and I saw him. Oh, if you say so. Oh, but... why don't you believe me? Because yeah, I can't conceive of anyone without a face, that's why. <laughs> now, all right, let's let's start from the beginning. Did you, did you see his eyes? No. Was he wearing a hat? Yes, a black one. Well, it could throw a shadow over his eyes so you couldn't see, couldn't see them. But possible. Well, it has but... to be. How the devil could anyone... He could have been in an accident, surgery. But how would he... Oh, all right, let's let's go on. Now, what what about his nose? No, I didn't see any. It could be the hat again. Mouth? His his mouth, Judy. You, you see, if the sun was hitting over his shoulder, then there'd be a shadow from his hat. In that case, the mystery's over. You're trying to make me feel like a, a fool. I don't care what you or anyone else think, but I saw a man with no face. You can know what you can do with your theory about the sun and the shadows. I don't know about flying saucers, and I don't take pills, and I don't smoke pot or whatever they call it. And I'm not crazy in imagining things. For your information, Alex, my eyes are still 20-20, and they saw, oh, God help me, a man without a face. <laughs> Alex, what's this all about? I mean, meeting you down the road instead of at your house. I didn't want Judy to worry, Ben. Well, I'm a police officer, not one of those secret agents you see in the movies. Ben, she says she saw the patient from Clearwood. Is that why you got me out here like this? He escaped. You make it sound like he's Jack the Ripper. Because he's from Clearwood, you got the idea he's a raving homicidal maniac. Oh, sure. All they've got out there are a bunch of lovable folks who are just a little mixed up. Mm. You're really upset. Never seen you like this. I uh, guess I didn't know how much until right now. Judy ran into him on that, that big curve near Clearwood. Well, she wasn't the only one. We've had calls from all over. Funny, you get sober citizens see him at the same time. And miles apart and dressed different. Happens every time. Take a hot day, mix in a little imagination. Now, this was real. Of course it was. And Judy's not... Well, she's not the type. Now, take my word for it, Alex. Every time something like uh, this naturally, happens... Naturally, they're, they're doing something about it, like cruising the highways, enjoying the scenery. I'll give him credit for enough brains to hide out. Oh, I suppose you want police officers out in the field. That's where they ought to be. Sure. We'll hire a couple of hundred extra. Won't that make the taxpayers jump for joy? <laughs> come here. What for? Now, come here. I won't bite. I want you to hear this. Now, this is five. This is five. Receiving five. Is that you, Ben? Over. Uh, look up something for me, will you? Over. Go ahead. Over. Uh, how many identifications we got on the Clearwood thing? Give me a second. Here it is. Ben, we got 12 so far. Over. Hear that, Alex? 12. Everyone's a positive, too. Point blank range. Over. What's the spread? Over. This will kill you. Nearest one is two miles. Longest is over 30. Over. See, Alex? Everybody sees what he wants to see. You still with me? <laughs> over. Yeah, right here. Over. Something you might be interested in. Over. Standing by. One of the boys here says it must be some kind of a... Calls it mass hysteria or something. About half the audience claim this guy is nothing like anything you or me ever seen. Like how? Get to it, will you? Well, they say they had a close look and that he ain't got a face. Like you and me. A man without a face. Judy is not the only one. But think for a moment. In this last part of the 20th century, and its attendant wonders and discoveries, what is true and what is unreal? Is there anything no longer possible? Is there? I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Well, the doubt.
doubting Alex knows that there's nothing wrong with his wife's power of observation. She did see a man, and though he does have a face, there is something missing. A mouth. Result of an accident? Or is he a mutation? A gruesome congenital result? Or perhaps from out of this world? Let's join Alex and see if we can find out. This is Alex Harper calling. Could you connect me with the director of the sanitarium, please? Rich is here. I'm sorry to bother you, doctor. I'm Alex Harper. I have a place on Route 36, about eight miles from you. Well, of course. I've passed by there quite often. What can I do for you, Mr. Harper? Doctor, I hope you won't laugh or anything, but I have a couple of questions about this fellow who broke out of your place. Oh. That's his name? Michael? Michael what? Well, now, we have no full identification. He gave us only his first name. But he was a patient at Clearwood, wasn't he? In a sense. Was he or wasn't he? Well, only for one day. You see, Michael is a rather unique case. Most unique. In all my years, I've, I've never seen anything like him. Look, I have to speak low because I don't want my wife to hear. She's in the kitchen and she's plenty upset already about your Michael. Well, she, she, she's seen him? Where? Have, have you notified the police? Well, I, I thought I'd speak to you first. She saw him and, and from what she says, she's either crazy or hysterical. And I can tell you she's not either one of them. Well, Michael is, uh... Well, he, he, he's different. Different? That, that what you call a guy without a face? Without a... The eyes, nose, and the rest of it? Well, of course. Well, then my wife, she didn't she didn't see what she says she saw? Oh, I haven't said anything like that, Mr. Harper. What I was referring to was his appearance, not his powers of reasoning or social behavior, because, quite frankly, he didn't talk to us. Outside of his name, we couldn't establish contact with him at all. Well, what about his, as, as you call it, appearance? Uh, Michael... Has no mouth. From what we can tell, he was born without a mouth. Now, we don't know how he communicates, but... Or if he does at all. Or how he manages to ingest food. Truth is, he wrote his name on a scrap of paper. You see, Michael may be something quite... Quite new to our world, Mr. Harper. Perhaps one of a kind. Uh, maybe he's, uh... uh, uh... Oh, what's the word I'm hunting for? Mutation? Yeah, that's it. I hope to God that he is what he appears to be. A freak. A one-time thing. But suppose he's only the first, the beginning of perhaps a, a new kind of man. Alex! Be right in. What were you... Oh, no. Oh, it's I... only an old ashtray. No big loss. How'd that happen? I got up when you called, and this case was on my lap, and it fell off. And... Well, you'll pick up the pieces, won't you? I've got something cooking. Sure. Hey, it's open. Uh, Judy! Judy, the bag is open. What's open? Oh, well, never mind. Well, what do you know? Hey, will you look at this? Uh, now, Alex, you want me to ruin supper? Well, it's almost like a miracle. You see, Ace found this bag, and I couldn't figure out a way to open it. Just, it looks just like a, the kind of bag Doc Stevenson carries. You don't have to be an engineer to open one of those. Oh, yeah? Well, this one has no lock or no nothing. And when I just dropped it and broke the ashtray, it opened up. And look what's in it. Let me see this eighth wonder. All these bottles. Hey, that's strange. Hmm? Doesn't feel like glass. Plastic? Mm-mm. Not plastic either. I never felt anything like this. Well, what's the difference? Say, here's one that says cardiac arrest. And this one's cerebral occlusion and lymphoid carcinoma? Agina pectoris and respiratory carcinoma, spinal sarcoma. And, and, and this one at the end, tuberculosis. Alex, <laughs> what... what? is all this? What are these pills? Well, how should I know? Except, except that they're important. 
Hmm. Well, here's one that's different. For cuts, bruises, and dermatological eruptions. Looks like talcum powder. It obviously belongs to a doctor. But what a doctor? What does that mean? Have you ever heard of a doctor who has a bag full of pills that cures heart disease and cancers, not to speak of stroke? The worst plagues of mankind, and here in our hands are the answers to what science has been searching for? Cures? <laughs> Those pills aren't cures. Who ever heard of a pill curing cancer, heart disease, or stroke? Uh, what, why not? Think a moment. Look at this bag, Judy. Ever seen anything like it in your life? I tell you, I don't understand it. I don't know where it came from, but it's, it's, it's like nothing on this earth. And these pills, now go on and laugh if you want to. I know they can do what their labels say. Now, I can't prove it, but I know. All right, dear. If you want to think that, you go right on. I've got dinner to make. Now, don't patronize me. Alex, aren't you carrying this a little too far? You don't seem to realize what we have here. And you do. Those things could be dangerous for all you know. Oh, my God. Now, how can I prove... Whoa. Wait, there is a way. And right now, here, help me. Here. No, don't, Alex. All right, then I'll get these bandages off Please. myself. Uh, I, now, I'm begging you. Now, the doctor now, said that... It's kind of awkward. Now, get scissors and, and cut some of this away. Now, get it. I won't be part of this this stupidity. Now, you've lost now, your mind. Are you going to help me or not? Now, once I get the bandages off, I'm, I'm only going to put some of that powder on the stitches and on the skin where it's so red. That's all. A little powder. Well, now, what can happen? What? Honey, don't you realize what this is all about? If this should work, and it will, you'll see... Then those pills for cancer and, and heart... See now? Alex, these things happen in stories, but not... It's... No, it's for you. You'd be well. Don't you understand? When Doc told me what he'd found, that, that you had a heart condition, I... But, but, but he assured me it was nothing to worry oh, about. Oh, the old bedside matter. He wanted to break it to you easily. Did he tell you that it no, was... No, I can't say that. But how can heart disease be anything but serious? So when... When somehow the bag opened and I saw what was inside, I, I couldn't think of anything but that you could be cured just like that. Oh, honey, I love oh, you. Oh, Alex, I guess it's all right. Where are they? Here they are. <sighs> That's better. All right, now, now, careful now. You don't want to want to cut those stitches. Good. That's that's fine. Oh, the skin is so red. Sorry, you look a mess, I know. Mm. Now, please, give me that bottle of powder or whatever it is. Alex. Now, please. Here. Hmm. The bottle is warm. Well, it's a hot day. Oh, it feels as though it's, it's generating the heat itself. Isn't that wild? Judy, will you do the honors? Just, just shake some all over. All right. That... That should do it. A little more. It's all covered. Mm, that ought to do it. Feel anything? Mm, not yet. How long do you think it'll take? <laughs> that is, if it... Well, it, it hasn't even been 30 seconds. I, I suppose it'll uh, take a little time, though. I, I didn't expect a miracle like uh, like that water into wine kind of thing. The powder's got to work its way in. Well, I'll, I'll get some fresh gauze. You still ought to keep it covered. Yeah, that, that might not be a bad idea. I wonder what's bothering Ace. Oh, there he is. Alex. What? What is it? Look over there. It's him. The one Ace is running after the man I saw on the road. The man without a face. Right, I'm going after him. Now, lock the door after me and call the police. Oh, no, don't go. Let the police handle it. Now, he's heading out to the East Fields. Now, call him. Tell him. He might be dangerous. He... No, I, I won't get too close. Just enough to keep track of him till the police get here. Oh, just thinking of him. I'm so frightened. Oh, no, no. There's no need to be. I'd, I didn't want to tell you before, but I talked to the head of Clearwood and this guy, this, this Michael is his name. He's a little queer, but he's not dangerous. Anyway, there's nothing to worry about as long as you stay inside. Twice in one day. Why here? He's not after you. What reason would he have? I suppose not, but somehow... <sighs> Alex, that's what he wants, the bag, the medicines. It must be his bag. He's come for it. Him? A doctor? It has to be. That's the only explanation. Oh, I'll give you another. He's escaped and wants to stay off the main roads. After all, you spotted him, didn't you? He just wants to get as far from Clearwood as he can. 
By chance, he was cutting across our place when he ran into Ace. Now, look. Now, I'm going to go after him before he gets too far. Remember, the police and the door. Now, don't get your dander up, Alex. We've known each other too long for that. Now, you just show me again where you saw this fella last. Ben, I know that a good cop ought to be skeptical, but by God, I saw him run under that tree, then up and over that fence. Now, why would I lie? I don't mean to make out that you did any such thing. It's just so darn queer. Huh? Well, look for yourself. Look at what? That's it. Nothing to see. Oh, come on now. Let's stop this rustic routine. Mm. No footprints. Prince? Feel the ground. Soft, isn't it? So it's soft. Then where are the prints? You say he was running? Yeah, with Ace right behind him. A man running puts down a mighty heavy print. Heavier than if he was walking. He could have gone across these rocks? Yeah, could have. But nobody could jump from rock to rock. Why, it must be 20 feet between them. Yeah. Unless he can fly. Must be clear out of the county by now. Now, how do you come to that conclusion? Ace. That's why. If we were anywhere near that there Michael, we'd be here an ace. You know he's always been a noisy dog. Well, he could have lost interest and run off after a rabbit or a woodchuck. Yeah, maybe. Something right over there, Alex. To your right. Grass is too tall. I can't see a thing. Something black. This side of that thorn bush. I see it. He's wearing black. Everything black. Yeah. Come on out. Stand up. Now, I'm telling you for the last time. Put up your hands and come out. Hmm. Now, I'm going to fire a shot in the air, and if that doesn't fetch you, I'll put the next one into you. Ben, I don't think he's coming out. He won't shoot, will you? Just you watch. But he isn't armed. How do you know that? Well, if he was, he could have cut you down. Standing up, you make a beautiful target. Yeah. You got something there. I'm going in. I got an idea. He's so scared he can't move. Now, don't be stupid. Come back. Oh, my God. Of all the stupid things... Oh, I... it's Ace. Our dog. He's dead. Yeah. Gee, I'm sorry. Oh, there... Uh... There isn't a mark on him. Look at his face. Oh, it's horrible. If I didn't know better, I'd... I'd say that something scared that dog to death. There is no medicine for fear. The icy chill that reaches out with frigid fingers to clutch the heart. The shadow of the inexplicable Mr. Michael hovers close by, and the lives of at least two people will be irreparably altered. We'll find out how when I return shortly with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago, News Radio 78. family dog has died mysteriously, and the presence of Mr. Michael is as real as if he had knocked at the front door. Now the ride back to the farmhouse is a silent one, broken only by a few perfunctory remarks as it comes to an end. I'll keep in touch, Alex. Mm -hmm. uh, if you see anything, give us a call. Yeah. Mighty sorry about Ace. Well, see you, Alex. You okay? Okay. Is that Ben in the police car? Yeah, it's Ben. Oh, you should have invited him in. I guess so. I, I just didn't think. Judy, Did he get away? The man who... Uh, oh, Ben thinks he's out of the county. Oh, I hope so. Judy, we were following Ace. Alex, and I... look at it. It's a miracle you were talking about. I met about. Ben and we were over in the Call North the doctor. Field. He'll drop everything and come out when you tell him. <laughs> and I was the one who didn't believe. I, I, I don't understand. 
understand you. I thought you'd be jumping up and down because what you said would happen did. I'm so happy for you. Huh? Don't you hear me? Alex, look at your arm, your left arm. My God. My God in heaven. I didn't believe it. Oh, what an idiot I was. <laughs> Talcum powder. <laughs> you want to know the truth? I thought you'd flipped. <laughs> Absolutely over the deep end. <laughs> telling me to shake powder off. Hey, I'm moving it. You see? Like it was before the accident. Oh. Like a young arm. It's brand new. Yahoo! <laughs> no more pain. No more stitches. No more pain. <laughs> he not believe it. He won't believe it. Oh, Dr. Please. Stevenson. Boo. Boo on all Get doctors. Here. Hey, what do they know anyway? Oh, uh, you'll never, never have full use of that arm. However, if you followed my advice, <laughs> you'll think I borrowed another arm. Look, not a single scar. Uh, looks like the skin was never even scratched. Oh, it's so wonderful. Oh, and I love you. You won't be angry with me. Oh, how could I be? And why should I be? The, the doctor's bag, the one Ace found. Yeah, the bag. Where is it? I have it. We'll get it. Now that we have proof, Judy... Judy, you're going to be as good as new. The proper pill and no more heart condition. Hear that, world? Listen, oh, gracious universe. Well, it's on the desk. Well, what are we waiting for? Alex. Look, if it works like the powder, we'll stand them all on their collective ears. Judy. Judy, the bag is locked again. I was so full of doubts. When you left, I looked at the bag and... Oh, Alex, to me it was the embodiment of everything evil, and I wanted to destroy it, so so I picked it up, and and somehow I pushed the flap down. Well, no, I can't, I can't tell where where one part fits into another. See, I, I, I can't find a seam anywhere. I, I, I think it was just about here. Try, try, try there. No, no, that's no use. I'll drop it on the floor, maybe like last time. Still in one piece. I'll try again. No use. Oh, forgive me. Right now, we've got to figure out a way to get the bag open so we, so we can get you a heart pill. Alex, you have an electric drill. I can try. I'll take it out to my workbench in the barn. Well, why not wait until morning? It's getting dark now. Uh, no, time like the present. Now, give me a shout when dinner's ready. If I'm lucky, I may be back before then. I'll get this thing open if I have to use dynamite. Now, here goes. The instrument will not achieve penetration. Who? Do not be alarmed. I mean you no harm. You know who I am? Michael? I am he. Don't, don't come any closer. There is nothing to fear. There is no belligerency in me. I have a gun. This rifle is loaded. That is a weapon? Yes. It can bring an end to consciousness? Easily. It is not my intention to cause any fear. But you have. You killed my dog today. The creature threatened me. And I did not intend to. I did not realize how weak it was. A simple mental probe and... I regret the occurrence. Haven't you ever seen a dog before? They are... Images in books and pictures. There are no dogs or animals where you come from? There is barely enough room for the higher forms of life. We have never learned to curb our reproductive powers, it seems. Well, where is this place you come from? The, uh, this is Earth, the third planet from the sun, I, I think. <laughs> I know. It is my home, too. Oh, that, that can't be. I exist. But not of your time. Not of my time? Time runs on. There is a past, a present, and a future. The threads are simultaneous. Oh, now you don't expect me to I leave. Am fatigued from my experience, and I must return. If you will kindly give back my case to me, the one you have on the bench. It's yours? That is why I have come. It was misplaced. Lost, but now that I have found it... Well, there's no argument about it, Doctor. It's yours. I am not a doctor, not in the context of usage in your time. Uh, well, uh, who cares? Listen, 
The case was opened. I, I don't know the how. The mechanism but... is faulty. I must exchange it. You, you did not utilize any of the contents. Well, only some of the powder and the bottle labels. Yes, 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 I am aware. But I did a fantastic job with my arm. Look at it. Look at it, Michael. Would you believe that only a few hours ago it was a mess? I am well aware of the powers inherent in the powder. But now, please give me the case. You cannot open it. For the key is in my hands alone. I, I stay back. I, mu I must open it once more. Or you will. I've, I've got to have something from it. Comprehend this. My time is far in your future. The compounds are off. Another time. Different metabolisms. Evolution has caused basic changes. Yeah, but the powder worked on me. It is probably the single exception. I don't believe you. Look, I'll give you anything. Money. How, mu how much do you want to open it? I shall prove my point to you. You must be aware of the differences in our physiognomies. You mean your, your, your face? Exactly. The lack of an aperture above the jawbone. You call it a mouth. Have you wondered then how we are communicating? I have no mouth, for we ingest our nourishment through an osmotic process unknown to you. And if I have no mouth, then how do we communicate? Well, I... You... I, you are moving your mouth, and I... I hear. I, on the other hand, send my thoughts to you through my mind. You see this is so? Yes, yes. Think of it in this manner. I am you in a distant time. You should be able to comprehend, then, that medicinal compounds of my time may not be of benefit in yours. The differences is, in us are too great. Uh, but my arm... You were lucky to have chosen that particular container. My wife will die unless she has a pill. Just, just one pill. I have explained why you cannot have a pill. Uh, open that... Open that bag or I'll kill you. I, I mean it. My demise will not help you comprehend. An unusual accident took place. A time warp misfunctioned. And I found myself in your time. The accident must have disturbed my balance. And I wandered from this place, leaving my case behind. We have communicated sufficiently. I feel joyous that your infirmity responded to the powder. But I cannot allow you... To maintain possession of the case any longer. Stop. I took a vow to protect it with my life. I must fulfill that vow. Give it to me. <laughs> I gotta hold you for a while. You don't realize it, but you told me how to open this. You said the key is in your hands. It'll open to your handprints. Now, now your right hand on the bag. Oh, nothing. Well, maybe, maybe both at once. There. I'll, I'll try, I'll try one on each side. Yes, yes, I've got it. Judy, Judy, it's open. Come on, Michael, wake up. Come on, you're okay. A piece of ice on your uh, cheek should help. Uh, uh, That's it, easy now, fine, fine. Uh, how do you feel? I thought your aim was to... to extinguish me. <laughs> no, 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 no. I only wanted one of those heart attack pills. You see, my wife Judy has a heart condition. Well, well, she had a heart condition. Thanks to you, we don't have to worry about that anymore. This other person, your wife, she ingested the dosage. It's like a flash. After she saw what happened to my arm, she had no hesitation. If I could only have just... One of each of those different pills, I wouldn't have that. I have communicated to you that I am not a physician, yet you have refused to accept the truth. You insist I am practiced in medicine because I possess a case apparently similar to physicians of this time era. Well, you can't blame me for thinking you that. You will not communicate. You will listen. You poor man. Poor Poor individual. Let me inform you of my... my profession. I am... proudly... 
the highest ranking exterminator. Exterminator? Precisely. I communicated earlier that in my era, there is barely enough room for all who inhabit the planet. Therefore, exterminators trained to eliminate painlessly and quickly. Oh, no. The pills, as you refer to the compounds, are each a dose of death. The case is full of death. The tools of my oh, trade. Oh, no. All except the container of first aid powder, which I keep for my personal needs. Fortunately for you, for you are now thoroughly healed <laughs> up. But the rest... Oh, but the, the, the label, the, the, the tuberculosis, the heart attack, the cancer... The compounds act within oh. a matter of minutes. Oh. Bringing death, of course. Instead of resorting to the crude murders of earlier, more primitive eras, it is more comforting for the family to report that one of its members has died of cancer, heart disease, or any one of a dozen other diseases. Oh, murder. Diminution. Murder. My case. Uh, you must you must have an antidote. If, if you make a mistake, there must be some Errors way you can... are not committed. I am sorry for your bereavement. <laughs> I shall depart. Be assured. There was no pain. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Surely there were those who were skeptical. A man from another time who conversed through telepathic means? Much too fantastic. Alex Harper would look with infinitely sad eyes and agree that it was too much to expect anyone to believe his story. Except for one thing. And he would bare his left arm. Explain this, he would say. And if you can, I will agree that I dreamed the entire nightmare. I'll be back shortly. In a ditty from a well-known operetta, the words are, Things are seldom what they seem. Skim milk masquerades as cream. And as you have just heard, words alone may tell only part of the real story. But for stories guaranteed to increase your pulse beat, my suggestion is the Radio Mystery Theater. Our cast included Patrick O'Neill, Marion Seldes, Ian Martin, and Leon Janney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I know. I know. I hadn't emptied the tub. The water's still there. It must be. I'll, I'll show you. I don't understand this. Tub's bone dry, ma'am. Hasn't been used. Now, not, not tonight, anyway. His clothes. Howard's clothes. He'd empty his suitcases and put his clothes in the closet. His, his suitcases, too. Just ladies' clothes. Yours, ma'am? Yes. Now, hey, uh, look, don't cry. I, um... <laughs> hey, look, look, this dream you had... It was no dream. Okay, okay, so maybe you imagined... That... I didn't imagine anything. <laughs> Do you imagine a husband? Do you imagine a month-long honeymoon? Do you imagine a man in a chair with a knife in his chest? This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense. Welcome to the fear you can hear. But mostly, welcome to the world of terrifying imagination. In this story, you're going to meet what some people call a shutterbug. You know what a shutterbug is. The kind of person who never goes anywhere without a camera swinging from a strap around his neck. Who is never content unless they're aiming a lens in your direction, whether you want to be photographed or not. But unfortunately, this particular bug is the kind that many people want to crush under their feet. We all want to get rid of Kellerman. We want to kill him. And so do you. That's a lie. You hate his guts as much as we do, Mr. Bailey. Why don't you admit it? Of course I hate him. But that doesn't mean I'm ready to commit murder. Well, we're ready, Mr. Bailey. And you'd better be, too. Our mystery drama, A Choice of Witnesses was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Paul Hecht. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. It begins on a warm day in early spring, the kind of day which tempts office workers to leave their desks and stroll through the nearest park on the noon hour. Among the strollers is an amiable young man named Gordon Bailey, who is enjoying the sunshine so much that he's taken a sandwich lunch to a park bench. He knows it's not going to be a very good sandwich, his wife, Pam, prepared it with her own loving hands. And even after two years of marriage, Pam seems unable to cope with even a hard-boiled egg. Oh, uh, excuse me, mister. Okay if I sit down here? Oh, yeah, sure. Plenty of room. Thanks. <laughs> nice day, isn't it? Yeah. It's about time we had some good weather. That's a good idea. I mean, uh, bringing your lunch to the park. Oh, that's my wife's idea. We're on an economy drive. Yeah, money's tight these days. Very tight. Uh, what line of work did you say you were in? Oh, I think I said I was in the insurance business. No kidding. Well, now, that's what I call a good business. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> hey, that ought to be a cute picture, huh? That little squirrel up there, cute as a bug, huh? Well, you like to take pictures of squirrels? Well, me, I like to take pictures of everything. In fact, I do this for a living. Oh, you're a professional photographer? A kind of... I make a buck out of it sometimes. I suppose you sell pictures to the newspapers? Oh, no, no. I never sold no pictures of the papers. I sell them to people. Well, well, I guess I'll be uh, heading back for work. Uh, wait just a minute, Mr. Bailey. I don't remember telling you my name. Oh, I guess I know your name on account of the badge. Badge? What are you talking about? The badge you wore at the convention at the hotel in Atlantic City. Oh, wait a minute. You were at the insurance convention last month? Yeah, I was there. I get a lot of good pictures at conventions. Some of my best. I see. <laughs> or uh, maybe I don't. Well, you know how it is. A bunch of guys get away from home, away from the wife. They do a lot of crazy things. Oh, uh, would you like to see the picture? Of uh, the insurance convention? I'll tell you the truth, Mr. Uh, my name is Kellerman. <laughs> Frankly, I just don't understand why you'd be carrying around pictures of a bunch of drunken insurance men. <laughs> yeah, you were gassed, all right. I've never seen anybody more gassed than you were, Mr. Bailey. You mean you have pictures of me? Yeah. That's what I was trying to tell you. You like to see them? They're real beauts. I don't think I ever took better, Mr. Bailey. All right. All right, let me see them. Oh, yeah, sure. Here they are. I'm in my pocket here. Yeah. Look at this one. Oh, no. She was really stacked, huh? How did you get this? Well, I told you with my trusty little camera. But how? Hey, come on. What do you think? I'm not giving away no professional secrets. You were in that hotel room? 
She yeah. let you into that room, didn't she? You must have been hiding someplace. Hey, 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 hey. don't do that. Don't tear that. What do you up. think I'm going to do with him? Oh, come on, Mr. Bailey. You know I got negatives. I can print up 2,000 of them if I want. What is this? Blackmail or something? Nah, nah, nah. It's like a business deal, that's all. I figured I got some pictures that you want to buy. And I got them to sell. How much did you pay her for the privilege of being in that room? The question is, how much are you willing to pay? I mean, so your wife don't get a complete set. Look, are you willing to sell me the negatives? I didn't say that. I got a different kind of deal of mine. You know what would happen if I told the police about this? Well, a guy did that to me once. It was a meat packers convention. He called the cops. They hauled me in. I said I was just a photographer working the convention. That's all. I was selling pictures of the guys there. He couldn't prove nothing against me on a account of, you know why? It was true. I am a photographer. I do work conventions. I sell regular type pictures, too. But they're not as profitable as these, are they? You know, that guy became one of my steadiest customers. Only then his wife divorced him anyway. He wouldn't make no more payments. Payments? Are you saying this is a regular thing? How much you earn at that insurance company? I figure a young guy like you, they pay about uh, 15, 18,000 a year, am I right? Listen to me, Kellerman. The woman at that convention, I... I didn't want to get mixed up with her. I, I was just so tight, I, I didn't know what I was doing. Oh, hey, you don't have to tell me about stuff like that, Mr. Bailey. I've been around plenty. I know how guys no, are. No, 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 you don't understand... Look, I, I'm only married two years. I, I love my wife very much. And the only reason I got into that stupid mess was... It was because of my boss. I, I didn't want to insult him. He he was drunker than I was. Oh, come on, Mr. Bailey. You don't have to explain nothing to me. I know you don't want that nice little wife of yours to see these dirty pictures. And I don't want to show them to her, believe me. She'd never understand. Pam would never... Listen. Listen, I'll tell you what. I'll give you a flat price for the negatives, and that'll be it. Understand? I, I got a nice bonus recently. I'll give you a, a 300 cash tomorrow afternoon. How does that sound? Now, listen to me, Mr. Bailey. People are real funny about this kind of business. They never believe a guy like me can, well, like be honest, you know? Honest? <laughs> That's some word. Well, what I mean is, they always think that if they pay me a flat fee, I'll be coming back at them again. You see what I mean? Even if I did give you the negatives, you'd think if I had copies someplace that I could hit you again any time, right? Look, I'm willing to take your word for it. Nah, Mr. Bailey, nah. You just spend the rest of your life worrying about me coming back. Am I right? But this way, you just make one small payment to me every month. Like you pay the electric bill at a rent, you know? How much? How much do I have to pay? I figure you for about uh, 40 bucks a month. Now, that's not so terrible, is it? Just 40 bucks a month? How do you collect the money? Oh, in person, Mr. Bailey. I just go around to all my customers once a month, and I collect in person. <laughs> it's better that way, believe me. Forty dollars. It's more eighty a year. You never miss it. And everything would just be fine between you and the missus. Is that you, honey? Yeah, it's me. Hey, shut up, you mutt. Hi, darling. Don't be quiet, Lockjaw. It's your lord and master. I'm sorry I'm late. I decided to do a little Christmas shopping after work. I forgot how long it takes to fight those crowds. Oh, what a gorgeous package. Is that something for me? Never mind. <laughs> well, just in case it is, here's a big kiss in advance. Mm. Hey, you smell good. Is that a new perfume? Mm -mm. It's the same old stuff. The one I'm practically out of. Hint, hint, hint. Oh, cut out that hinting. <laughs> I've already spent more money than I should. Oh, uh, speaking of money, that man was here. What man? You know, the one that comes around every month. That Mr. Uh, Kellerman. Kellerman? What the heck was he doing here? It's only the 19th. Well, I don't know, Gordon, but he was here just the same, looking for you. What did he say? Nothing. Just that he'd be back later. Later today? Mm-hmm. You know, Gordon, I just can't bear that awful little man. Did you ever get a look at his eyes? And that camera he wears around his neck. 
Listen, is he going to be coming around every single month? I told you, honey, he's collecting payments on the car. Well, why can't you make the payments by mail? Uh, because that's the way he likes it. Maybe he moves around a lot. Well, he gives me the creeps. You want to get that, honey? I'm feeding the dog. Yeah, okay, I got it. Oh, it's you. Evening, Mr. Bailey. I heard you came earlier today. Yeah, but you aren't home yet. Hope I didn't disturb your wife too much. Look, we'll talk in the hallway. Oh, yeah, of course. All right. What's this early visit all about? You going away for the holidays? Oh, no. I never go anywhere this time of year. This is one of my busiest times of year, you know? Yeah, I can imagine. I get some of my best pictures around now. You'd be surprised. You know how it is. People get all filled up with the Christmas spirit. All right, all right. Get to the point. (laughs) You want your payment now? Well, I wouldn't mind, of course, but uh, that's not the reason I came around, Mr. Bailey. You see, I want to tell you that uh, the payments are going to go up. What? I really hate to do it, but it's the inflation, you know? Everything costs more, food, clothing, film, gasoline. I'm just going to have an increase, Mr. Bailey. I'm sorry. How much of an increase? Well, just another $15 a month. Fifteen. Terrific. Now it's 55. What's it going to be a couple of months from now? Ah, shut up, Lockjaw. Excuse me, Mr. Bailey? Yeah. What what can I do for you? Uh, May I talk to you for a moment? Do do I know you? Uh, No, I don't think you do. My name is Bliss. uh, Dave Bliss. Yeah. Uh, look, can we sit down and talk a minute? Well, it's kind of chilly. Why don't we talk standing up? I'm trying to walk my dog, and so far he's, he's been a non-performer. Well, I want to talk to you about Ed Kellerman. I don't know any Ed Kellerman. Well, I know you do, Mr. Bailey. I made it my business to find out. Now, I'm not asking what he's got on you, Mr. Bailey. I'm sorry, you're making a mistake. It doesn't matter. I won't ask you why Kellerman is blackmailing you. I expect you'd do as much for me. Only, would you mind telling me how much you pay him? He hits me for 60 a month. Used to be 40. Price went up last month. 55. You mind paying it? (laughs) Of course I mind. So do I. I'd mind if it was 10 bucks a month. And not just because of the money. I hate that slimy man, and I'm sure you hate him as much as I do. Now, that's why I wanted to talk to you about putting a stop to him. A permanent stop. You mean going to the police? No. That's not good enough. I'm talking about killing him. <laughs> Every problem has a solution, they say. And Mr. Dave Bliss seems to have arrived at his. The obvious question here is, do two wrongs make a right? We'll find out what Mr. Gordon Bailey thinks about that dilemma when we return shortly with Act Two. Blackmail is an interesting, if dishonorable, crime. It has the unusual facility of making the criminal feel virtuous himself. After all, he's only punishing wrongdoers by making them pay for their sins. But the profession has some serious drawbacks. For one thing, it inspires one's victims to think in drastic terms. And when there are more than one victim... And they meet. Well. Mr. Bliss, I know how you must feel about Kellerman, and you're right. He is one of the slimiest characters who ever crawled out from under a rock. Those eyes. You ever get a look at his eyes, Mr. Bailey? My wife can't stand the sight of him. Well, I'm not married. It's my job he's threatening. Is it your marriage he's after? Uh, Never mind. I don't want to know any details. None of us know each other's problems. None of us. You mean you know others beside me? I know others. How come? 
Well, I made it my business to find others. Oh. One day when I got fed to the teeth with Mr. Kellerman and his payments and his wet eyes, I decided to find out more about our friend. So when he left one day, I followed him. Followed him on his rounds. And that's how you found me. Yeah, that's right. You're in the root book, Mr. Bailey, just like all the rest of us. How many are there? Now, there's no way of telling for sure. All I managed to find was a dozen, an even dozen. <laughs> Man really gets around. He keeps raising his price. Do you know that? He's only had me in his bag for about six months. This is my fifth. But others I've spoken to, they say he raises the ante every few months. Three of the people I've talked to are paying well over a hundred. Mr. Kellerman does very well. That's obvious. Yeah, too well. <laughs> you know something? It's funny, but... Well, it's kind of a relief to know that I'm not alone. Yes. That's what I felt at first. Misery loves company. But the satisfaction doesn't last, Mr. Bailey. You still live every day of your life with that sword over your head. I know, I know, but it's still not a reason for using words like... like killing. Don't you know that's the only possible way to deal with a blackmailer? I wouldn't know. Kellerman's my first. Well, think about it. No, no, you must have thought about it already. You wouldn't be human if you hadn't thought about it. It crossed my mind. Not that I should kill Kellerman, just the wish that he were dead. And that someone else would kill him. Yeah. I guess I wouldn't shed too many tears. You just didn't want to dirty your own hands, right? I didn't want to take care of one problem and have another one even worse. And don't tell me that doesn't make sense. The only thing that makes sense is making Kellerman a corpse. I'm sorry. I'm just not interested in anything like that. The others weren't either. Not at first. But now. Now they all are. Oh? But what are you talking about? We all want to get rid of Kellerman. We want to kill him. And so do you. That's a lie. You hate his guts as much as we do, Mr. Bailey. Why don't you admit it? Of course I hate him, but that doesn't mean I'm... It doesn't mean I'm ready to commit murder. Well, we're ready, Mr. Bailey. And you better be, too. Ready for what? To commit murder. If you don't mind my saying it, a perfect murder. Perfect. Foolproof. I'm sorry. Look, that's a stupid dream and you know it. Ah, uh, you won't say that after you've heard the idea. Everybody who sets out to commit a crime thinks it's foolproof. They wouldn't commit it otherwise. Right now, all I want to know is if you'll cooperate. That's easy. No. Why not? Because murder is worse than blackmail. That's why. Well, this isn't murder. We're going to erase a human mistake. Forget it. Look, I'll make believe I never heard you say it. Come on. Come on, Lockjaw. Come on, girl. Well, let's get our business over with. There wasn't one person on the list I didn't have to convince. But when I told them that there was no chance of any of us being caught, that's when they dropped their objections. All right. What foolproof scheme for murder do you have? It's foolproof because it won't be murder. It'll be an accident. If anyone gets into trouble, it'll be me. Just me. I'm going to kill Kellerman with my car when he's making the rounds one night. I have the time and place all figured out just before midnight on Carroll Street. An accident. Right. So, now you know the favor I'm doing you. I'm taking the risk all by myself. You think the police are that stupid? Murderers get caught even when they frame accidents. Oh, this is different. Why? Because of the witnesses. What? I'm going to have witnesses, a lot of them. All disinterested parties. Nothing to connect them with each other. And they'll all tell exactly the same story. What they saw, how it was all Kellerman's fault, getting hit by my car. All right, all right, all right, stop. Don't tell me any more. You've already told me too much. No, you've got to hear the rest of it. You're a part of this like everyone else. Don't you see the beauty of it? Safety in numbers? If you ask me, you'll all get caught. No, no. Don't you understand? When a group of citizens all testify exactly the same way, I mean, reliable citizens from every walk of life, <laughs> you ought to meet some of Kellerman's victims. One is a college professor, two are doctors, there are four housewives, a bartender who owns his own joint, one working stiff, one person in city government. Uh, you might as well know that's me. Bliss. Wait a minute, I've seen your name. Something about the Transportation Authority? One of them is in the insurance business. Uh, 
They're all with me, Mr. Bailey. Every one of them has agreed. So many witnesses to one accident? Well, we won't need everyone. Some of them won't be asked any questions by the police, but they'll all be there just the same. Uh, we'd like you there, too. You're nuts. Do you know that? You and, and, and the rest of... I won't have any part of this. Don't you see? It can't miss. It doesn't matter. I don't want to have any part in killing a man. <laughs> How come, Mr. Bailey? Have you got religious scruples or something? Maybe. You've got scruples, but you did something rotten enough to make you a blackmailer's victim. I didn't commit murder. Look, you got a good idea about getting everyone together. Maybe, maybe if we all went to the police. Oh, no way. Whatever it is you don't want known about yourself, my friend, it'll come out the minute Kellerman gets arrested. Now, now my way is better. I can't buy it. Look, I'm sorry, my dog is getting tired and so am I. Come on, come on, Lancho. Now, wait a minute now. You want my advice, Bliss? Don't go through with this. Find some other way. There has to be one. Goodbye. Bailey. Yeah? What if we do it? You'll be sorry, that's what. Sorry? Why? Because you'll tell the police the truth? I didn't say that. Goodbye, Mr. Bliss. <laughs> Hello. Evening, Mr. Bailey. How are you? I'm all right, Bliss. What do you want? You going to be busy tomorrow night? What do you mean, busy? Well, some of the gang are getting together tomorrow night. A corner of Carroll Street and 9th Avenue, about 9.30. How about coming down? You might see something interesting. Look, you can't go through with this. We're all in it together, remember? You might not have to do a thing. Just stand there and see it happen. That ought to be satisfying all by itself. I won't be there. Well, we'd sure like to have you, Bailey. You won't get away with this. Nobody ever does. Oh, shut up, Lockjaw. What's the matter with you tonight? Gordon? Yeah? Do you think Lockjaw's all right? She keeps staring at the door and growling. I don't know. Must hear the neighbors or something. Oh, maybe she's waiting to bark at that man, the collector, you know? Kellerman? Uh-huh. Isn't he coming tonight? He usually comes on the last Sunday of the month, doesn't he? Uh, yeah, yeah, usually. Well, I doubt if he'll be here tonight. It's almost 11 now. Oh. <laughs> I didn't realize it was that late. You haven't done much this evening. Don't you feel all right? Yeah, sure, sure. I, I'm all right. Well, you, you just seem to be... Well, waiting. Was it for that man? Because if it was, well, I'm, I'm sure he's not coming, honey. I think we ought to go to bed, listen yeah. to the news or something. Oh, the news. Yeah, I guess it's on right now, isn't it? Just about. You want me to turn it on here? Yeah, sure, would you? Okay. The conference, now postponed until February, will include top officials from both nations. On the local front... A man who has been identified as Edward Kellerman of 1811 Kellerman. Edward Avenue Gordon, was struck the same in an automobile tonight on the corner of Carroll Street and 9th Avenue. The driver of the car, city administration official David Bliss, was released after questioning. Five witnesses on the scene of the accident testified that Kellerman had stepped into the automobile's path For as it rounded the corner. Sake. In sports, the Golden Warriors Shut it bounced up, our home. Uh, Gordon... Do you suppose it's that man, the collector? You think that's the reason he didn't come around tonight? It would be a good enough reason, wouldn't it? If he was dead, lying in the middle of the street, dead. You look so strange. Gordon, did you like that man? If you want to know the truth, Pam, I hated him. You did? Why? Just on general principles. I really don't understand you sometimes, Gordon. Uh, hand, me, hand me the phone book, huh? Okay. Thanks. Here. All right. You gonna call somebody? Uh, honey, uh, why don't you go to bed? Uh, I'll be in in a few minutes. Yeah, but, but who are you calling? Just someone I know. Uh, someone who knew Kellerman. Oh, I see. To find out if they know about what happened to him. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Okay, honey. I'll go in then. I'm feeling a little tired. Yeah, so am I. I'll be right. Good night, sweetheart. Uh, good night. Hello? 
David Bliss? Yes, who's this? Gordon Bailey. What do you want? I heard the news tonight. About Kellerman. Well, you don't have to thank me. I did it for myself. And you did go through with it, huh? You can relax now, friend. You've just saved yourself 55 bucks a month, maybe a lot more. Your remittance man won't be coming around again. You ought to go out and celebrate. I know what I ought to do. And what's that? So long, Bliss. I just wanted to make sure. Hey, Bailey. <laughs> Obviously, there's one thing you can say for David Bliss. He's a man of his word. And because Mr. Bliss kept his word, two indifferent interns are now lifting the mortal remains of Mr. Edward Kellerman and depositing them in the efficient cold filing cabinet of the city morgue, awaiting for someone to claim the body. But who cares about a dead blackmailer? Possibly Mr. Gordon Bailey. We'll find out shortly when I return with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago. As David Bliss and company manage to commit the perfect crime, so it seems... Since the death certificate for Edward Kellerman simply states the cause of death as accidental, at least a dozen people know otherwise, but they remain silent, feeling not grief, but relief. The only one who finds it difficult to maintain that silence is the one victim of Ed Kellerman who was not on the corner of Carroll Street and 9th Avenue that fateful night. Honey, do you know it's almost 2 o'clock in the morning? Oh, is it? Really? You know, I honestly think you are coming down with something. A virus, maybe. Pam, will you please stop fussing? You're beginning to sound like my mother. Well, I certainly wouldn't want to do that. I'm just trying to get you to go to sleep. You've got a job to go to tomorrow. You know, it's funny about my mother. When I was growing up, she made me feel that there was something... I don't know, something so profound about religion. Well, if you ask me, she just likes the bingo games. My father was that way, too. But neither one of them really seemed to live their religion. You know what I mean? I mean, they talked about loving their neighbors and so forth, but they didn't love them at all. They were always saying the nastiest things about them. Well, that's how people are. When I was in my teens, I used to call them hypocrites. Now, I just wonder if I'm any different than they were. I really don't think I am. Different how? Well, about things like the Ten Commandments, for instance. I wonder if there's one I haven't broken. I hope you haven't coveted your neighbor's wife. That's about the only one I can remember. I remember them all. You do? Yeah, I won a prize in Bible class when I was only eight for reciting all of them. Thou shalt not this. Thou shalt not that. There are only eight shalt nots. Thou shalt have no other gods beside me. Thou shalt not worship any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Thou shalt not kill. Yeah, sure. I'll have that file completed in time for the meeting. Righto, Phil. Bye. Oh, Sylvia, did you reach that number yet? No. Okay, well, buzz me if you do. All right, now, let's see about that actuarial table. Hello. All right, Bailey. What is it now? Hello, Mr. Bliss. I've been having a lot of trouble reaching you this morning. Well, I haven't been at my desk. I was wondering if you might be free for lunch. Sorry. I'd really like a chance to talk to you. About what? About some mutual friends of ours. If we're talking about the same thing, Bailey, they're not mutual friends. They're all strangers, complete strangers, just like you and me. Well, that's something I'd like to rectify. Would you have lunch with me? All right. All right. Where? I suppose we meet somewhere halfway. Uh, I know you're in the city hall area. I'm on Wall Street. How about uh, Mercury's? Do you know it? I'll see you there at 12.30. That's fine. All right, Bailey, let's have it. You don't want a social lunch. You have something on your mind. You're right. Something I can't get off my mind. 
About our old friend Kellerman, I suppose. You remember what you said about him? How he was a sword hanging over your head? So? He's still that for me, Mr. Bliss. He is exactly that. Kellerman is dead. He won't be ringing your doorbell anymore. How come you're not grateful for that? If Kellerman had really been hit by a car, if he had a heart attack or something, yes, I admit I would be glad about it. I would have gone out and celebrated. I would have slept very well at night. But the way things are, I'm not sleeping at all. Try pills. I'm just sorry you ever came up to me in that park. If I didn't... If I didn't know it was going to happen the way it happened, it never would have bothered me. But I do know. And it bothers me too much. So? The thing is, I don't know if I can live with it. You want to be more specific? I don't know if I can spend the rest of my life with this thing on my conscience. Your conscience? <laughs> Look. You had nothing to do with Kellerman's death. I don't know what you think Kellerman had on me, Bliss, but it wasn't anything illegal. Just immoral, right? It was something stupid I did. Well, there was nothing stupid about what we did. Wasn't it? Are you really so sure you've committed the perfect murder? Shut up! Don't you ever use that word in front of me. You're still afraid, aren't you? Afraid of being found out. It can't happen. Not as long as we all stick together. Oh, safety in numbers, right? When the police came, they only questioned four of them. Every single one told the same story. There was no reason to doubt their word. Why should there be? Because there was no connection between them. Right. They were all strangers. Nothing to tie them to each other. Except Kellerman. <laughs> What about the records he might have kept? His, his little black notebook, for instance. We thought of that, too. First thing we did when we went to his body was lift that book right out of his pocket. Oh, what about the apartment? What about all the stuff he had there? The second thing we lifted was the key to his apartment. One of our guys, a Joe, the bartender, went straight there. He cleaned out every scrap of paper in the place, every single one of his rotten photographs. You were very thorough, weren't you? Yeah. We were thorough, Bailey. And you ought to be grateful, not worried. But I am worrying. I'm worrying about whether or not I should... Go on. Whether or not you should what? Bailey, are you thinking about going to the police? It occurred to me. You mean you'd turn me in? I don't know. I just don't know. Did it ever occur to you to turn Kellerman in? Yes, often. But did you? No. Why not? Wasn't he committing a crime? Wasn't he disturbing your precious sleep, too? Yes, yes, he but was. But you didn't turn him in because you were afraid for yourself. Isn't that the truth? Yes. I suppose so. So all this morality of yours, this conscience you talk about... You didn't discover you had any until Kellerman was gone, until he was no longer a threat to you. Isn't that true? I still say blackmail isn't murder. Bailey, I've got news for you. I wasn't going to tell you this unless it was absolutely necessary. Tell me what? Kellerman may be gone, but his photographs are still around. What? You heard me. We have all of Kellerman's negatives, all the dirty pictures he ever took. Most of them have been returned to his victims. Everyone who cooperated with us. I see. That means we have your pictures, too, my friend. You understand? And if I don't cooperate, I get a new blackmailer. Is no, that it? no, that isn't the way it is at all. Kellerman bled you, Bailey. Every month he came whistling up to your front door asking for money. More and more money all the time. But that's over now. Done and finished. So what you're saying is, if I go to the police, the photographs go where I don't want them to go. I'm sorry to use Kellerman's own tactics, but you're forcing my hand. Bailey, please use your head. You've got nothing to gain and everything to lose. Somebody's done you a favor. 
The only way to show your gratitude is to forget it. What do you say? Well, I'll think about it. That's all I can tell you. Want any more coffee, honey? No, thanks. You look so... so tense, Gordon. Yeah, I guess I have been acting pretty jumpy tonight. Well, you've hardly said two words to me since you came home. The thing is... I've been thinking a lot, Pam. About what? About... whether I had the nerve to tell you something. Something that happened about... well, seven months ago. What do you mean? Pam... You remember that insurance convention I went to back in July in Atlantic City? Of course I remember. I I couldn't go with you because of Mother being in the hospital. I wish you had been with me. Then nothing would have happened. What what did happen? Did did you get into some kind of trouble? Yeah. Yeah, I got myself into trouble by by being stupid, by drinking too much and letting Hal Emmons drink too much. Emmons? You mean your supervisor? Uh, I was still new on the job. You remember, Pam? I wanted to make good. Yeah? I was afraid of Emmons taking a dislike to me, afraid of crossing him. And we both got drunk that second night. Emmons insisted that we pick up these girls at the park. Gordon! Honey, I swear, I I didn't want anything to do with it. I I wasn't the least bit interested. But, you know, Emmons is the kind of guy who uses conventions to swing a little. You know, I... I told him I was crazy about my wife, that home cooking was good enough for me, but he just pressured me, Pam. Oh, Pam, can I make you understand? Go on. What happened? We brought the girls upstairs. They had adjoining rooms. They were professionals, you see. Gordon. Oh, honey. Gordon, why do you have to tell me about this? Please don't cry. I wouldn't have known if you hadn't told me. It's on my conscience, Pam. Your conscience? Oh, sure, I could have kept my mouth shut, but... I guess I, I needed to tell you. I guess I wanted you to know so that you could forgive me. God. I've been tortured about it for months. Honey, you have no idea what torture it's been for me. But that's the dumbest thing of all. Don't you think I would have forgiven you a long time ago? Oh, oh please. Hold me, Gordon. Honey, please. please. It'll never happen again, honey. I swear. <laughs> Oh, darn it. We're just getting cozy. Okay, I'll I'll get it. Hello. Mr. Bailey, Dave Bliss here. What do you want? I have something for you, a present. What is it? About half a dozen photographs and the original negatives. I decided they really belong to you. Uh, That if you knew you were really out of danger, you'd sleep a great deal better. Do you want them? All right. Uh, Put them in my mail, uh, to my office. And have some secretary open them by mistake? No, I don't think you'd care for that. You could mark it personal. Supposing I hand them over in person, tonight. Whereabouts? Well, right now I'm in a bar called Adam and Eve's on 12th and Walnut. I'll be here for another hour if you can make it. Otherwise... Well, it'll have to be some other time, that's all. Oh, well. All right. All right, I'll be there in half an hour. Gordon, you're not going out? Just for a little while, honey. I got some client business. Besides, I can use a little fresh air. You're not still feeling bad, are you? No, no. I I, I feel just fine. I never felt better. Maybe I'm crazy to do this, Bailey. Maybe I'm putting my neck into a noose, giving you back these photographs. And why are you doing it? Because of what you said to me. You said I was just becoming another blackmailer, another Kellerman. And I guess you were right. If I held on to these, I'd have become the very thing I despised. Well, I give you credit for honesty, Bliss. I hope that having these will change your mind about going to the police... I hope you'll realize that I did the right thing, that we all did the right thing. I can't answer that. Then you're still thinking about it? You want to know something? I told my wife tonight about these. What? I told her all about the girl in Atlantic City. She knows exactly what happened. Oh, that doesn't mean to say she wouldn't be horrified to see it in black and white. That's why I'm glad to have these pictures. What else can I say but thanks? You could say that you won't go to the police, ever. Sorry. 
I can't make any promises. Ah, uh, yeah. I was afraid you felt that way. Well, let's have another drink, okay? No, no, not for me. Just one more. Hey, Joey. Coming. Really, I, I, I have to be going. My wife's waiting at home for me. What'll be, Mr. Bliss? It's trouble, Joey. All the trouble we can handle. Yeah. I figured it had to be. Hey. Hey, what is this? Sit right there, mister. Put that gun away. Oh, my God, Bliss, what are you doing? Go on, Joey. All right, all right, all right. Let's get the story straight now. What happened here, Joey? Well, look, Sergeant, you know me. You know I don't like trouble in my joint. Well, what did the guy do? Try to hold you up? That's right. He come in, he sat down at the bar, he pulled out a forty-five and stuck it in my gut. Boy, that's a strange one, all right. I mean, the guy was some kind of insurance executive. It's that's all right on his business. Well, he God. must have gone off his nuts, Sarge. Look, you can ask anybody, all of my customers. This gentleman right here was at the bar. Yes, officer. My name is David Bliss. I'm with the city, officer, and the bartender's right. The guy just sat down and pulled out the gun. Yeah, that's true. And when the bartender tried to grab it away from him, it went off. What's your name, lady? Mrs. Edith Chester. It was a pure case of self-defense, Sergeant. I'm just glad nobody else got hurt, you know. Yeah, yeah, you were lucky, Joey. You were all lucky. Okay, I'll need some statements now from some of you other witnesses. <laughs> And so, for poor Gordon Bailey, there was no safety in numbers, only extinction. We admit that this is a grim demonstration of the old saying that, in union, there is strength. But we sincerely trust that justice finally prevailed. I'll be back shortly. If there's a moral to this story, it might be that eyewitnesses can't always be trusted, even when they're being honest. Of course, we don't worry about your eyes on this program. We're interested in your ears, and we have good news for you. Many thousands of ears are now listening to these exercises in imagination. We hope you'll continue to be an ear witness. Our cast included Paul Hecht, E.V. Juster, Ralph Bell, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up, Contact, the 12-Hour Allergy Capsule, and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. imagination, the fear you can hear. This time, a contemporary tale concerning the ill-fated flight of the first American woman astronaut, the flight of the Diana One, a tale of three astronauts who reached Skylab only to be literally snatched into the void. But before Diana One ever left the ground, the aura of doom hovered around her as she stood poised on the launching pad. This is Diana Control. We've been holding a T minus 45 minutes while the faulty computer monitoring the loading of propellant has failed. This is a scrub. We will set back countdown to T minus 13 hours. Uh -huh.
McDonald of Capcom. Gordon, do you read me? I read you. I'm sorry for the bad news. It's a scrub. Roger. Tell Luke I'm sorry, too. And uh, what do I say to the doctor? Same thing. Same for all of us on the team. Yeah, but it's tougher on her. I mean, you know, the disappointment. First American woman into space and all. I'll tell you, I'll manage it. Don't you worry about her. Over and out. Roger. Only I do worry. Ships, whether they ride on air or water, just don't mix with women. <laughs> mystery drama, Out of Sight, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Julia Mead. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. might have been far better if the scrub on the Diana One had been a total. This was only another in the long series of delays that had plagued the spaceship and haunted not only the astronauts themselves, but the ground crew as well. Returning to the compound from the launching, the most concerned of all was the first of Our Lady astronauts. I don't mind admitting it. But I really feel like as bursting into tears. Who doesn't? Well, the difference is you're a man. And I'm a woman. No doubt of that. Although I must say I go for you a lot more as you are now than in the spacesuit. Down, boy. Back off, Marine. Hey, what are you getting so sore about, Navy? You got her. And I mean to keep her. Yes, sir, Captain. I mean, uh, Commander. Hey, hey. Don't pass my digs. Aren't we all having dinner together? Yeah, sure thing, but I want to get me a shower and a shave first. We were up on that, uh, that rocket so long, I practically grew a beard on my knees. <laughs> well, I'll see you later. Good old Luke. I'm glad he's the third member of the team. Mm. Oh, no. The second. I'm the third wheel, Gordon. And do you know why I wanted to burst into tears? Yeah, like all of us. Disappointment? No, a lot more than that. Oh, Gordon, maybe today was an omen. Maybe I should cut out right now. I've got the strongest hunch this flight is jinxed. And I'm the jinx. <laughs> At the window, Gordon. I didn't mean to wake you. It's okay. What's wrong, Terry? Look, darling. The sky is filled with stars, glistening like fish in a net. Oh, hold me a minute. Of course. How many nights we've talked about this trip. Hope to make it together. All the long training and planning. And now it's... Here at last. Oh, almost here. Uh, I'm not going. What? I'm not going, Gordon. Oh, but you've got to. You can't back out now. Lieutenant Nettles is back up for me. Oh, but she's not a doctor. She's a woman. That's the important thing. I wasn't picked for this trip primarily because I'm a doctor. But why would you cut out now? Because I'm scared. Oh, honey. Everybody gets buck fever. You know, I had it my first time. This is more than buck fever. Well, what is it, then? It's not me I'm scared for. It's, it's you and Luke. Why? Because I'm a jinx. No, you're not going to start him with the superstitions like Luke. It's more than just superstition. Oh, darling, I... I can't tell you, but I've been lying awake and getting the strongest ESP waves. You were dreaming. But I wasn't. I was wide awake. And oh, I... for the love of Mike. Don't do this to me. But it's you I'm thinking of, darling. I want you safe. And I honestly, for some reason, I, I can't explain why, 
I think if I go up there now, with damn you... damn it, then... Terry, I never thought you'd do this to me. And I never thought the first woman astronaut would be such a flop. Oh, I'm so ashamed. You better answer that. Hello? Oh, yes, sir. Did you reach Luke Strong? Good. Yes, sir, we will. Within the hour. Oh, no, I can drive. Yes, sir, we'll go straight to the hospital unit. Uh, thank you, sir. Good news for us, too. What is it? Weather forecasts are for a quick change in conditions that would ground us for two to three weeks until, well, unless we get off tomorrow. They've restarted the countdown, and it's go. We lift off in seven hours. I've committed you, Terry. If you don't go, it's a total scrub. Are you with me? Oh, you know I'm always with you, for better or for worse. Not just as a wife. Ready, willing, and able, Skipper. Astronaut Teresa Weber reporting aboard. Pilot to Capcom. Do you read me? Yes, Commander, we read you. Are we still on countdown? Yeah, Gordy. T5 and counting. Any okay with you? All systems are go here. Check, Luke. Everything reads good to me. Cabin pressure is holding at 6.1 pounds. Roger. We are T40 and counting. Looks good all the way. Good. Keep me posted. Roger. Over and out. How do you feel, Terry? <laughs> now that I'm here, great. Hang in, lovely. You've only begun to live. What do you say, Luke? Well, let's get it all put together. Skylab, Skylab, here we come. That's the spirit. Let's check out the inertial guidance and the boosters again. What do I do, Captain? Just sit tight and get ready for the thrill of your life. <laughs> This is Diana Control. The D1 countdown is at T minus 35 seconds and counting. All systems are reported in a go condition. Pilot, co pilot, and Dr. Weber are ready. The Diana spacecraft umbilical is cut. We have transferred to internal power. We are counting down starting now 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence starting. 5, 4, we have ignition. All engines are running. We have a liftoff. The clock is operating. We are underway. Roger. Read you loud and clear. We're smoothing out some now. Roger. Right, through max Q. Through max Q and smoothing out real fine. The sky looks very dark outside. Cabin pressure is holding at 6.1, okay. Coming up on two minutes. Roger, reading you loud and clear. Pitch 25 degrees. Your flight path looks very good. We're up on S4B stage burn, and I read it. Mark, two minutes. Roger, you have 22 seconds to shut off. Roger. Read that, Luke. What do you reach your velocity? 25,668 feet per second. Roger, we confirm. Coming up to burn off. Six, five, four, three, two. There she blows. Gentlemen, you are in orbit. Hallelujah. We've achieved orbit. Woo! Skylab, Skylab, here we come. You are go for a dock. Roger. Ah, uh, you'll be losing me now. I'll pass you on to Bermuda. Roger. I'll see you in a couple of hours. Have a happy. We'll give you a final uh, okay on docking then. Roger. My buddy thanks you, my wife thanks you, and I thank you. Over and out. <sighs> okay, Terry. What do you think of space flight now? Oh, it's marvelous. Wonderful. A rocking chair. I don't know what was the matter with me. Well, whatever it was, as long as it's gone, let's put it out of our minds. Now, this is going to be a milk rock. A what? I'll tell you. A young man like me and a young woman like you wouldn't dig that talk. It's from World War II. But I've read about it. A milk run was uh, like when you flew out to bomb and came back and knew old Hitler didn't have any more planes to bother you and you were just as safe as if you were taking a ride in your grandmother's electric automobile. A piece of cake. Yeah. 
But the best piece of cake we got riding with little old Diana is the middle astronaut here. Okay, Luke. Playtime's over. Let's run a full instrument check and give uh, Terry a chance to start working on her medical reports. If I have to put up with wearing these electrodes like Frankenstein's monster, let's at least make it worthwhile. your signal, Hawaii? Do you read me? Anything wrong, Gordon? No. We just passed out of range of Hawaii. We should be picking up on Houston and Mac any moment. It's always kind of scary, though, isn't it? What? Anytime the tracking stations don't overlap and you lose contact. Ah, oh, you get used to it. It's only for a few moments at most. Wouldn't it be... Wouldn't it be what, Terry? Oh, that's just silly imagination. No, you got me going. I want to hear what? Well, I was just thinking... Awful if we did lose touch completely with Earth. Not possible. Too many backup systems, different frequencies, emergency equipment. Yeah, but just supposing as uh, long as Terry brought it up, we did lose contact, what would happen then? Well, we could still fly the ship. But with no arrangement for splashdown, where would we fly to? Well, we can always dock with Skylab and use their equipment. We don't need ground to make a dock. Yeah, but if Skylab's equipment oh, goes out... Oh, come on now. It's just not possible, so forget it. I'm going to call in... Diana 1, this is Skycom. Do you read me? Roger. I sure do. Loud and clear. Good. We'll have half an hour's clear contact. During that, we'll give you coordinates for the dock. Roger. Now, let's synchronize our time. I'm coming up on 1032. That's 2232. Mark when I give you wow. Wow. Roger. I read you. Dead on the button. A-OK. Hear this, then. In order to achieve trend... Mac? Mac? You read me? Mac? What is it? Oh, dear. Let me try another frequency. Mac? Mac? Capcom, this is Pilot Webber. Do you read me? Damn, try another. Diana 1 to Capcom. Capcom, do you read me? I can't raise a thing, Skipper. I've tracked over Bermuda, Africa. Everything's dead. Every frequency. I can't understand it. All other systems are go. Yet we've lost contact with ground. That means we're we're on our own? Unless we turn up Australia, Hawaii, or Mac back at Houston. And if we don't? We head for Skylab. Is that so terrible? Certainly its radio must be working. And if it isn't? Now, that isn't anything I want to start thinking about right now. Maybe we better, because... Because what, Terry? You don't know, Luke, about my dream. For God's sake, there's no time for dreams. Hello? This is Diana One calling. That isn't going to do any good, Gordon. This is what I dreamed, that we'd lose contact. I remember that... That, that humming sound. You'll never get through it, even if we make Skylab. That would mean that... Thanks to me, the first woman, the Jinx, we're lost. We're lost in space. Can you imagine being condemned to wander in space till food and oxygen gave out? Or the orbiting vehicle you made your home plunged through the friction of the atmosphere to roast you to ashes in fire and flame. The very thought of it makes my blood run cold. But uh, perhaps you will prove to be made of sterner stuff when I return shortly with Act Two. For another full orbit... The Diana 1 circled the Earth. But it seemed that all communication was irretrievably gone. On all frequencies, on all tracking stations our astronauts tried to raise, they heard only that high, oscillating hum. Now we've got to face it. We're clear out of touch. There's only one thing left to do. Make the dock ourselves. Well, we've used up a critical amount of fuel attitudinizing ourselves to try to pick up Capcom signals. I know. Do we go for a dock this time around or wait till next orbit? Well, we've repositioned all the way around this time. We'll never be aligned more favorably. 
with a tweak burn, we ought to have precise apogee and gain on her enough to lock on to target with radar. How soon will we see the lab? 25 to 20 miles we ought to have clear. There she is. Ahead and just a little bit above us. She's right, Gordy. Okay, we'll intercept. We're on our own. We're going to have to chase for a while. But we're locked on by radar and fitting. Right on the money. Tight as an oyster. No thanks to me. What do you mean, Gordon? What is it, Skip? I don't know. You remember how we began to roll and swing over the Pacific? I thought you were maneuvering for the lock. I was trying to, but the ship just seemed to take over. We were rolling at 36 degrees a second. You pulled her out. It wasn't me. I don't you understand? I couldn't fly her at all. We were rolling so bad and yawing, I thought we were going to lose any control and go toppling end over end. But we didn't, thanks to you. And not me. It felt like... Well, it was just like ground or, or someone took over and was flying the ship. Someone else brought it into lock, not me. So what's the difference? We came home. Shall I open up the hatch so we can get into Skylab? Oh, we ought to secure everything here. Oh, we're tight. We can uh, get that later. We've got to reach ground. If we can't get in touch with Capcom... Oh, I'm afraid you can't. Huh? You oh. see, we have jammed it. Oh. How do you do? I am Drakon. I have been waiting for you. Who says, who's that? I have said Drakon is my name. Before I ask the other questions, where are you? I am here. Where is he hiding, Gordy? You know the setup here. But, my dear Earthling, I am not hiding. I ain't seen you yet. Nor will you. I am not made like you, nor are you civilized enough to be able to imagine me. Now, wait a minute. Now hold it, Luke. Uh, Mr. Dracon, if I have your name right. The title is meaningless for me, and even the name is only an approximation in translation to your tongue. Call me then, Dracon. Very well. Dracon, who are you? I will try to simplify. I am not of your galaxy. I am of Centauri 7, a quintillion of light years from your solar system. What's going on, Gordy? It's the sort of thing I dreamed. It would be easier if you had a, a present, Stracon. We could talk more sensibly then. Ah, uh, no, I believe to the contrary. You could not conceive of me even if I could make some emanation before your eyes. No, the voice must be enough. Well, then, what is it you want? For you to come with me. Supposing we refuse. But there's no way you can. I am going to take you to Centauri 7. <gasps> a quintillion years away? Time is a relative factor. We shall go by time warp. But even so, I am a doctor. I must face physiological facts. I don't know what your physiology may be, but if we... Earthlings, as you call us, should pass a destination a quintillion years away. We wouldn't arrive as anything more than dust. I have said that time is a relative factor. But we must leave. Are you ready to go? How? The trip will be short and not unpleasant. All those quintillions of miles? The advantage of the fifth dimension, the time warp I mentioned. But time is relative, as you said. Who's to say that your time won't destroy us? How long will it take us? In your time, you would indeed be infinitesimal dust, as the doctor maintains. In our time, a millimeter of a second, of which we have wasted quite enough. Shall we go? Here are your quarters. We have tried to construct them in appearance and solidity as those places you live on Earth. There are two bedrooms, one for the spouses and one for the drone. There will be food. You are welcome. We wish you to live as you live on your planet. For how long? We must control that. You are free to do as you will in these areas. Two bedrooms, two baths, living room... 
dining area, fully equipped kitchen. That's upper class New York, maybe six, seven hundred a month. Furnished up to a grand. Oh, except for one thing. And that is? Not a window. And out, outside of closets and, and the room is only one door out of here. Which, unfortunately, we must keep locked. Why? We have our own security. I think occasionally you earthlings must have caught a glimpse of our machines. We have been observing you for some time. Why? For reasons of our own. Our saucers have even landed on occasions, too, as you do in your flights to the moon, for example, to pick up informative material. We have even considered gathering some of you before this... But in the areas we landed, we did not consider the specimens quite satisfactory. We do very much consider you excellent representatives of your primitive culture. We have selected you as, what is a word you use, Uh, guinea pigs. You mean we're going to be locked up here like in a laboratory cage? Yes, so we can study you. Now I leave you to get adapted to your new surroundings. I have brought the earthlings, O ancient one. You did not pluck them from the planet itself. No, ancient one. From the atmosphere. From one of their spaceships. Why did you pick these? One is a female. Our first opportunity to gather such a specimen without alerting the earthlings. So be it. What is your wish now, Rekha? Permission to start the test. As you wish. Gordon, there's nothing in the big bedroom. It's just a box with some furniture. No openings anywhere. Any luck here? The front door doesn't have a handle, let alone a lock. The only openings are that vent up there and one on the floor on the opposite side. Air vents, obviously. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to breathe. You find anything, Luke? You think it's okay to talk? No, but we might as well. I'm sure we're bugged and they hear everything we say. What did you find? Nothing. You? Neither of us. Except two air vents in this room. If there was some way to... You hear a kind of hiss? Yes. And, oh, it's, it's getting stifling in here. They've turned on some kind of heat. Damn. What are they trying to do? I've got to get this suit off. I'm sorry, Terry. Oh, it's okay, Luke. Just forget I'm a woman. <laughs> That'll be a day for the old prowler. Now, but let's strip down. Come on. Nobody needs to have any hang-ups. I can tell you, as a doctor, we can stay in our thermals. It's safer if they try to roast us alive. Where's that ever-loving heat coming from? Probably the vent at floor level. Yes. Hey, come on. Let's all stuff our suits against it. Maybe we can keep it out. Good thinking, Charlie Brown. Man, I tell you, this is no way to go. You rotten sons of guns. Come on. Fight fair and give us a chance. Stop it, Luke. I don't mind dying. But I want a chance to fight back. Luke, it isn't doing any good. Don't give them the satisfaction of... Gordon. Yes, Terry, you're right. I don't know if we're just blocking it or... Hey, wait a minute. What is it? He's testing to see if... They've stopped it. They've stopped feeding the heat. Thank God. I never could stand heat. I have a... I am scared witless of smothering to death or burning up in a fire. Who isn't? You all right, Terry? I'm okay, darling, but we've got to get out of here. How? I don't know. I'll leave that up to you fellows, but we've got to get away. To where? Anywhere but here. This is only the beginning. The beginning of what? The tests. Don't you see it? We're guinea pigs. And as a laboratory animal, you know what all guinea pigs have in common. You're the doctor. You tell us what. They're expendable. What's getting cooler... We passed the first one, but... Oh, no. What is it, Gordon? The other vent. Can you hear it? They're starting the Turkish bath treatment again. Just the opposite this time, I think. This is Operation Cold Freeze. How 
can we get up to block that vent? Luke, get on the other end of the table there and drag it over. Roger, Skip. Terry, bring the flight suits. Mm. That air is like dry ice. Well, I can take this better than heat. Here, Terry, I'll help. Now what, Skip? Oh, this is my weak spot. I can't stand cold. Both, get on table. Terry? Yes, darling. You get up. Luke's shoulders. I help. Then I I pass flight suits to you. Block out cold air. Here you go. I'm okay. Hand me the suits. I'm braced against the wall. Okay, Gordy. It's all right. No need. They shut off the freeze. Here are the suits. I got them. Come on down, baby. Boy, you're something to have around. Can you imagine old Gordy or me getting on each other's shoulders? Huh. I'm glad I'm of some use. Now it's the men's turn. What do you mean? This is only the beginning. How much more of this can we go through? One exposure or another is going to be too much for, for one or all of us. Let's try to get out of here. How? Only one way. The door. What we need is a prize of some kind. Oh, wait a minute. The table. It has metal legs. Help me turn it over, Luke. Sure. Yeah. There's a flange at the top and screws. Oh, now, if we just had something... <laughs> Would you believe? I just happen to have a nail file. Oh, baby, you are the most. Come on, let's have at it. Have we got the flange far enough in between the jamp and the door this time? This looks like it. Ready? If we do get the door open... Then what, darling? Now, first, let's get it open. Then we'll know. You ready, Luke? Roger. You too, Terry. Give us all the weight you can. I'm ready. Then all together. Set. On the count of three. Three lost and desperate astronauts. Far beyond the stars. Should they succeed in opening this door... What can they hope to find at best? Another world, and one apparently hostile to them. What infinitesimal chance do they have to return to landfall and splash down on old familiar Mother Earth? I'll return shortly with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago. Is there any threat worse to sanity than the unknown? And yet, faced with the prospect of death by any factor of the known, which of us would not gamble and reach for the unknown as an alternative? Our three lost astronauts are no different as they struggle to open a door on... On what? What kind of a world lies beyond it? She's open! Uh. Nothing. What? Well, there's nothing. Nothing outside, but... What? It may look like nothing, but it's solid. It might just as well be a wall. For you, it is. For us on Centauri 7, it is our world, but not yours. Are you now satisfied? But what do you intend to do with us? We must finish our tests before we tell you that. Now you are weary. First... You must rest. Terry. Terry, wake up. Hmm? What? What? Shh. Don't wake Gordy. I've got to talk to you. What on earth? Please. Please. Come into my room. Okay. Just a second till I find my shoes. Come on, come on. I'm coming. What is it? I've got to talk to you. Terry. We're all going to die here. We don't know that. Well, I do. And there's something I want before I do. What are you? You. 
I want you, Terry. Luke, listen to me. I'm not listening to anyone anymore, just myself. Now, Gordy stole you away from me, but just for once, I'm going to steal something away from him. Gordy is your best friend. That's for laughs. Everything I ever wanted in life, I had to fight him for. For space flight, the commandership of this one you, he always won. Came away from me. Not this time, not this once. You can't. I won't. I'll scream for Gordon. You do, and you get this in your throat. <gasps> I can't have you. He never will again. Oh, where did you get that knife? From the table. Three of them there. Okay, Terry. Come here. Get away from her, Luke. Go on, he. Look out. He has a knife. So have I. All right, Luke. You wanted to use the knife? Come on. Try it on me. That suits me just great. You bought yourself a real Donnybrook. Stop it. Stop it, both of you. Stay out of this, Terry. I won't stay out of it. And for the information of both of you, I have a knife, too. Okay, Luke. Drop yours. Let your lousy husband get me in the back, no thanks. Hey, stay out of this, Terry. He's had this coming a long time. Will you listen to me, both of you? Don't you see this is just another test? A what? Don't you remember? We're guinea pigs. They're testing every kind of reaction in us. Luke, please. I know how you feel about me. You love me. That's right, Terry. But not that way. As a friend, as you love Gordon. Love? Yes, love. You weren't made for hate or frustration or violence any more than Gordon is. It's them, Dracon or whoever they are, they're putting it all into your heads. They want to see how far they can provoke us, how much we can stand. They're the ones we have to fight. They're the ones we can't let win. What am I doing with a knife? Oh, God, Terry. Gordy, forgive me. I didn't know what I was doing. Neither did I. I woke up choking with this black hatred, and I... Where did I get this? They put them on the table. It's just as I said. Another of their tests. <gasps> What's that smell? It's coming from this lower vent. It smells like... Bitter almonds... That's cyanide. Get away from there. They sealed up the door again. We've got to get out of here. The bed... No, must... no, no. They're louvered doors. It'll seep through. We've got to get away entirely. How? Even if we could get the door open again, I... I, I, I thought of it when the heat was coming in before. I, I think the cover on that vent up there is loose. It, it's big enough to crawl through. Now get the other table, Luke. Right. Drag it over. I've got the table leg that we use on the door. Maybe I can pry it open with that. Come on, Luke. The smell is getting heavier. I'm with you. Okay. Now give Terry a hand up. There you go. Now open my shoulders. I got the table leg. All right. I give it to her. Then support her while she levers it. Okay, Terry? Yes. I think I can. It's, it, it's quite loose. I'm sure I can. Oh, look out! Can you scramble in there? If, if I can just... Uh, get your hands under her left foot, Luke. Roger. I'll get mine under the other. Now, lift. All right, Terry? Yes. There's a duct. I can't see where it goes. Is it big enough for all of us to get through? Yes, but, but how? Now, you're smaller than I am, Luke. I'll give you a leg up and Terry can lift from above. What about you? I'll get a chair, and you can haul me up from there. Come on, let's not waste any time. That smell is getting stronger. Terry? What, Gordon? Why are you stopping? Another turn? No. It's a dead end. Oh, no. Are you sure? It's blocked in front, and on both sides... Wait a minute. What? It's open above. Like a chimney. How wide is it? Oh, just a moment. It, it, it's round. About two, no, no, maybe three feet in diameter. Any light? No, just as dark in here. It's no use. We'll have to go back. Well, we can't go back. Not for that cyanide. Maybe they stopped pumping it in. What else can we do? We can try what mountain climbers do. What? Terry? Yes, Gordon. Can you stand up where you are? Yes. I think if I... Yes. I'm standing with my head in the chimney. All right. Now listen carefully. 
Remember when we climbed old Baldy? Yes, a million years ago. Now hang in, baby. Don't you flake out on it. I won't. You mean that guide that showed us how to chimney climb? Yes. Now turn towards me and put your back against the wall. Now, can you get your feet up there on the other side? Just about. Then I, I brace my back and, and push up, right? Right. And slide your feet up an inch or two and keep repeating. Roger. You'll have to go next, Luke. You get it? I get the idea. But supposing that thing's 30 or 40 feet tall. We go as far as we can, and we all fall and break our necks together. Hold it. What now? It's getting wider, but I think it's another dead end. Oh, not another chimney. I couldn't make it. This one goes down... There's a draft and... Oh, Lord. What? We only had a light. I have only one match left. I've been saving it. it. It's wider. You think you could come up here? I'll try. Watch it, darling. You're, you're right at the edge. Where do you suppose this could go? Yeah, there's fresh air. Maybe outside. Let's see. Well, maybe we've gotten a break at last. That's only about a 30-degree pitch. Ah. Well, there goes the match. Yeah, but where goes the tunnel? I'll let you know any moment. If anything happens to me, you and Luke can try going back. Oh, no, sir. Anyone tries the roller coaster, old Luke gets to go first. No, Luke. Here I go. Feet first. Too bad I forgot my parachute. Geronimo! Luke. Luke, are you all right? I didn't break anything. Should we come ahead? Might as well. But you sure ain't gonna like it when you get here. Oh, all that for nothing. Right back where we started. At least we don't have to bother about trying the lower vent. We know where it goes to. And at least there's none of that cyanide gas. Yeah, but now what? Now we have finished with our external examination. I am sorry to say that the continuation of our test program may be even more unpleasant. Now look, if you let Captain Strong and my wife go, you can... Just a minute, old buddy. Same offer here, Drake Connor, whatever your name is. Only I stay. I'm afraid not satisfactory. The female is essential for more reasons than one. Why? First of all, your physiology is quite different from the male. We will want to study that. Secondly, you are a doctor. We can use your expertise to dissect your male companions so that we may study how to work on you. No, absolutely not. I won't lift a finger to help you. Suppose we were to offer to let your husband go. I'll answer that. No. Let me. Darling, I'd gladly die for you. But I couldn't kill for you. I wouldn't expect you to. I love you. I love you. And we both love you, Luke. One for all. An awful one. I guess we bought it for good this time. But wherever we go, we stick together. Very well, Earthlings. I will give you your wish. You'll have to execute a turnaround. Hey, Diana, one, do you read me? I read you loud and clear. Why? I don't know. Funny thing. I had a loco notion, we all did down here, that we lost you for a couple of seconds. Not as far as I know. You didn't notice a... Uh, or a kind of a time lag? Now hold it, Capcom. You hear him, Luke? Mac? Yeah. I don't know what he's talking about. You, Terry? I... Uh... Capcom to Diana 1, do you read me? I read you. We registered a sort of oscillator hum during that two-second gap. How about you? I didn't hear it. I have a sec. You pick up anything on instruments, Luke? Or hear a sort of oscillator hum? I did. Just like in my dream. Or I think I did. And 
and are you sure as they come? The earth people will know nothing of our interference. Oh, ancient one, in their time reference, they were missing but the blink of an eye. And the three who were here will not remember. Can the eye of an earthling see a bullet? Can it follow the speed of light? They will not remember. As to the planet itself, what is your recommendation? Observing them close at hand, particularly the female one, I have seen a capability for self-sacrifice and love. There is some hope for them, then. We might allow them another millennium to better themselves. So be it. We will allow the Earthlings one final chance. <laughs> there are no such things as flying saucers and strangers out of space. And man is the only creature to travel the roads among the stars. I wonder. Oh, well, it may not be too much longer before we find out for sure. Only a few thousand years. I'll be back shortly. thousand years. The millennium. Perhaps the one mentioned in the book of the Revelation, when the angel came down from heaven with a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he bound the devil and cast him into the pit and sealed it, so that he should deceive the nations no more. Not a bad idea. Not a bad idea at all. We could all begin with the devil in all of us. It might just be worth a try. Our cast included Julia Mead, Sidney Walker, Ira Lewis, and Jack Grimes. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. And I'm afraid I'm going to puncture that theory of yours about Hatcher being something of a time bomb ready to blow up. I'm I'm certain that he's not dangerous. On what do you base your findings? Well, he's been under intense treatment and has begun to respond very rapidly. He's, he's mild and cooperative. He's almost childlike. I see. I've reduced the guard to one eight-hour shift, midnight to eight in the morning, and at all other times he is constantly in the hands of our nurses and therapists and other personnel. Well, you are something of a gambler, Doctor, taking that kind of a risk. No, 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 no. I, I don't think so. A doctor... Has it occurred to you that this entire mild convalescence may have been programmed into the mind of this man to throw you off guard? Oh, nonsense. I know a harmless man when I see one. To leave him unguarded is taking chances with the lives of many people. Heaven only knows what has been fed into his receptive and willing mind. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Marshall. Welcome to the terrifying world of your imagination. My story explores the dark, uncharted area of the human brain. 
Despite medical research, scientists admit that there is much that is still unknown about the flesh and blood computer which guides our conscious and unconscious lives. Let us listen as Colonel Edmund Plant of the CMI warns Dr. Gentry what dangers exist when we attempt to control this complicated human mechanism. Uh, let me explain, Doctor. Your patient, Kent Hatcher here, may be a time bomb. We have no idea what was done to him. But we do know, from other cases, what to expect. You mean, uh, brainwash? Perhaps. It's very likely Kent may have been subjected to deep and continual hypnosis. His mind washed as clean as a sheet of white paper. Then programmed to commit some terrible act against his own people. <laughs> Our mystery drama, Prognosis Negative, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sidney Sloan and stars William Redfield and Bryna Rayburn. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Colonel Edmund Plant was on an unpleasant errand. As he walked into the big, dirty, gray building, the military hospital for the insane known to the brass as the pit, he could think of many places he'd rather be. But this was a duty he had to perform, part of his job, and he wanted to get it over with as fast as possible. I hope this won't take too long, Dr. Gentry. No, no, not too long, Colonel Plant. All we need is your official identification. We've been able to identify him from his fingerprints, but the official rules call for your observation and signature. I know, I know. Uh, right this way, we've got him in a private room because of his condition. Yeah, here we are. Step inside, please. I'll, uh, I'll speak to him. I don't know if he'll respond. Kent, can you hear me? Uh, 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 Colonel Plant, your commanding officer, is here to see you. You want to talk to him? Six, five, three, listen to me, listen to me. What does that mean? Well, we don't know. That's the only response we've been able to get from him. Uh, Kent, do you remember me? Kent. See? Look at his eyes. No focus. He doesn't hear you. He's in a world of his own. Mm. Kent Hatcher disappeared on a mission behind enemy lines eight years ago. Ah. Two months ago, he showed up in a prisoner exchange. We had believed him dead in action. After seven years, he was declared officially dead. Well, does he have any relatives? Uh, a wife? Yeah, he had a wife. She's remarried. Moved away. Left the state, I believe. Anyone else, Colonel? No. So, here he is. Mindless, mutilated, tortured. No relatives, no friends. And his superiors embarrassed or annoyed that he's still alive. Now, I did not make the rules, nor did I persuade Kent Hatcher to take the mission. It was purely voluntary. I know, I know. Well, what do we do now? Of course, we will do our best to bring him back. Mentally and physically? Both, if possible, but it is doubtful. He has an overstrained heart condition. It's quite serious. So permanent physical recovery is doubtful. Perhaps it's all for the good. You would rather that he die? Uh, let me explain. Kent Hatcher may be a time bomb. We have no idea what was done to him. But we do know from other cases what to expect. You mean uh, brainwash? Perhaps. It's very likely Kent may have been subjected to deep and continual hypnosis. His mind washed as clean as a sheet of white paper. And then programmed commit some terrible act against his own people. Six, five, three. Listen to me. Listen to me. Doctor, I want this man kept under surveillance day and night. We cannot take any chances. Sam, I, Colonel Plant here. Oh, uh, Colonel, this is Dr. Gentry. Paul Gentry. Uh, uh, yes? Remember, we were talking just last week about the case of Kent Hatcher, one of your agents? Oh, where's that? Well, yes, yes. I'm afraid.
afraid I'm going to puncture that theory of yours about Hatcher being something of a time bomb ready to blow up. I'm, I'm certain that he's not dangerous. On what do you base your findings? Well, he's been under intense treatment and has begun to respond very rapidly. He's, he's mild and cooperative. He's almost childlike. I see. I've reduced the guard to one eight-hour shift, midnight to eight in the morning, and at all other times, he is constantly in the hands of our nurses and therapists and other personnel. Well, you are something of a gambler, Doctor. Uh, uh, a gambler? Taking that kind of a risk. No, 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 no. I, I don't think so. Doctor, has it occurred to you that this entire mild convalescence may have been programmed into the mind of this man to throw you off guard? Oh, nonsense. I know a harmless man when I see one. To leave him unguarded is taking chances with the lives of many people. Heaven only knows what has been fed into his receptive and willing mind. <laughs> You know your name is Kent, don't you? Yes, Doctor. Do you know your full name? Can you remember? Yes. Kent Hatcher. Very good, very good. Now, how do you know that is your name? You told me. You had a life before you were brought here. You were married. Can you remember that? No, Doctor. You had a daughter, Mary. She was very ill. I don't remember. You loved her very much. When she died, you were heartbroken. Heartbroken? You don't recall anything? No. Oh, doctor, I just wanted to remind you, you have a lecture today at the university. Oh, yes, 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 that's right. Thank you, Evelyn. Look, I'm uh, working with Hatcher. You know the case? I should know it. I've been transcribing all your notes. Well, I'm in the midst of giving him a series of perception tests, all very simple, just a matter of timing them. Yes, I know them, doctor. You think you could finish them while I'm at the university? Uh, well, yes, I, I guess I could, but... I, what? I, I'm just a bit afraid of him. I was in the office the last time you spoke with Colonel Platt. Uh, now, now, look, if you don't want the assignment, I'll, I'll oh, no, just no, get... No, 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 I, I want it. As, as long as you say he's... Well, okay. Good, good. I'll expect you in ten minutes. <laughs> Excellent, Mr. Hatcher. Excellent. Well, I'll, I'll have a good report for Dr. Gentry. Now, suppose we put all the equipment, the puzzles and the cards, back into their proper boxes. Proper boxes? The boxes they came in. You understand, don't you? I understand. I think you understand more than you pretend. Are you pretending? No. No. Oh. oh, don't get upset. I I'm no. sorry if I hurt your feelings. Six, five, three. Listen to me. Listen to me. Please. Six. Uh, sit down. Five, we have more three. to do, more Listen games to play. To me. Please. Now. Now. No, stay, stay now. Back. Stay back. Now. Please. Now. Don't let me. Now. Please. Now. Six. Five. Three. Listen. To me. Listen to me. I am grateful to the officials who have given me this airtime to explain a very serious matter. I am or was Ken Hatcher's doctor, and I must add my warning to the hundreds of others you have read in your newspapers and heard over the air. Ken Hatcher is dangerous, frighteningly Dangerous. Do not, under any circumstances, attempt to apprehend him yourself. Call the special numbers that have been set up for this purpose. Do not let his mild manner deceive you. He is a killer who will act without even the slightest provocation. The police have orders to shoot on sight. Morning, mister. What can I do for you? You want to buy a $200 coat for you, 18? I... Want some clothes. D different clothes. Oh, well, I don't blame you. You're wearing old painter's overalls. And where did you pick up that raincoat? At the automat? Give me clothes. Sure. Sure, mister. Didn't mean to hurt your feelings or nothing. Uh, look, I figure you about a 40 long right on this rack over here. So, uh, you just go ahead and help yourself, huh? You pick out what you want. I gotta go to the back of the store to, uh... Do a little alteration, okay? 
You just pick out what you want and then call me, right? Okay. I'll see you in a minute. <laughs> what was that number I seen in the paper? Where is it? Where is it? Here. Here. Right in my store. I recognize him in a picture in the paper. Also, I've seen it four times on the news. I don't know how long I could get. Six, five, three. Listen to me. Listen to me. <laughs> Now, the way I see it, Archie, the old girl's prime for the taking right now, with the right approach. <laughs> it's the booze talking, Freddy girl. You ain't got a cent out of you, Mrs. Mowbray. And you ain't got her because you ain't sharp enough to convince her. Look, Archie, you got to work these big jobs slow. You rush them, you end up with an empty hand. <laughs> Look, Freddy, that old tea leaves bit and the table knocking routine ain't gonna fool no one. Not even your stupid Mrs. Mulberry, who wants to get in touch with the spirit of her dear dead departed. <laughs> hey, take the bottle and get in the other room. Might be a customer for a reading. This hour, 11.45? Yeah, it's probably some drunk. All the better. They give bigger fees and no complaints. Now, get out. All right, all right. I'll be sitting behind the curtain in the kitchen. Yes? Oh, step inside, friend, and let Frederica Gillis solve your problems. You have... Yes, yes. Oh, look, step inside, please. That's better. Now, what's troubling you, friend? Money matters, domestic difficulties, fear of the future? There is a sign in your window. Spiritual reader, forecaster of the future, palms red. No, Please. no, not not that. Not what? The sign, the, the sign, room to rent. Oh, that. Well, that's a mistake, mister. We had our room vacant, but we really well, don't have... I a... took that room three months ago. I'm the lodger here. There ain't no more room. But the sign is still in the window. It's just a mistake. It should have been taken down. No room... No room, chum. Uh -oh. Uh oh. This way out. Wait. Uh, maybe we have got a room for this gentleman. What? Freddy, have you got... Top floor. Sort of an attic room, if you don't mind the climb. What? Wait a minute. You can't give him that room. Now, I've got all the photographic equipment in there. Well, you better clear it out, because I've just rented the room to this here nice gentleman. Uh, you want to take a look at it, sir? I'll take it. Without even looking at it? I think you better go up and then decide. I want to be fair about it. Uh, right up them stairs, top floor, first door on the left. Well, I, I don't need to look. Now do as you're told. Go upstairs. Yes, yes, I'll, I'll go. I'll, I'll do as you say. What is the crazy idea of that? Now, what do you want him around here for? For a very definite reason. I recognized him immediately. You did? Well, who is he? He's Kent Hatcher, the man the entire country is searching for. That one? And you let him in? Put down that phone, you fool. Put it down. Now, this guy, Hatcher, is going to be the one thing we need to pull off that caper with Mrs. Mowbray. This is the biggest piece of luck we've had. Frederica Gillis, in her own canny way, recognized more than just the features of the hunted man. She knew intuitively that he was susceptible to hypnosis and made up her mind to use this susceptibility to further her own nefarious plans. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Several days have passed since Kent Hatcher, the hunted man, found refuge with Frederica Gillis and her accomplice, Archie. She has not permitted him to leave the house and, in fact, has been working to disguise his much-publicized, scarred face. That you, Archie? Right, Freddy girl. Come out here in the kitchen. I want you to see something. Come on. 
Well, Archie, how do you like him? Good. What a change you made in his appearance. You've even given him a new hairdo. <laughs> Looks a lot different with the dye job. <sighs> Takes years off his age, blacking it up like that. Uh, wait till his beard grows out. That'll cover most of the scars. It's terrific. Well, Kent, how do you like your new look? I like it. <laughs> Thank you. Only his name is not Kent, Archie. That had to be changed. His name is Mazumodar. What? He's going to be Mazumodar, the Indian mystic. He'll darken his face, let his beard grow out, and then with a fancy, uh, uh, what do you call them, things they wrap around their heads? Turban. Turban, turban, that's it. Oh, can't you just see him in a rich-looking robe with a turban on his head? Now, wait, well, what's on your mind, Freddy girl? Oh, you're not very quick, Archie. Now, look, what I have in mind is... Mazumodar. Mazumodar. Do you hear me? I hear you. What is your name? Tell me your name. I am Mazumodar. Now... I want you to go to your room, and you are to stay there until I call you. Repeat what I have told you. Go to my room and stay until you call me. Now, go. I go to my room and stay. That's amazing. It's amazing. He's behaving like a little lamb. Oh, I could sense right from the moment I laid eyes on him that he was an easy subject. Oh, we're going to give Mrs. Mowbray the greatest spirit show she's ever seen in her life. She'll hand us her money in a bushel basket. Everything ready, Archie? Yeah, I think so. Now, let's run over the list. Wind effect, whistling sound, eerie music. Okay, but not too much. <laughs> When she does get in touch with her dear departed Kenneth, what's she going to ask him? And what's our phony medium Kent going to reply? Mazumoda. Remember that. Okay, Mazumoda. What's he going to say? Now, you can't guess what the old gal might ask when the seance starts. Look, I've been working with him all week. If the going gets too rough for him and he can't give a good answer, I'll just break things up, stop the seance. Say that the contact with the spirit world is broken. Okay. What time is she coming? Oh, I told her 8 o'clock. Well, now, just to get things straight, now, I'll be in the kitchen. All the sound effects will be piped into here where the seance has taken place, right? Right. Mm. And when I want the sound out, I'll say, Mazumodar, do you feel a presence in this room? And I fade sound out and Mazumodar takes over. Huh? That's all there is to it. And Mrs. Mowbray will be here in 30 minutes. Mrs. Mowbray, this is the great Mazumodar. Oh, d does he does he speak English? Oh yes, I've asked him to conduct the séance in English. Ah, he's agreed, though he'd rather do it in his own language. Oh, I understand. Thank him for me. If he is able to reach out into the great void and bring my son, my dear son Kenneth, back to me, even for an instant. Mazumoda will do his best. I told him of your great sorrow and he was sympathetic. Weren't you all seeing one? I am sympathetic to the sorrows of a grieving mother. Oh, oh, bless you. Bless you. Please help me. Let us begin. Sit here at this table, Mrs. Mowbray. Yes. You there. Yes. I will sit opposite you. The great Mazumoda will sit between us. Let the seance begin. Uh, 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 what, what is it? What is it? Silence. Mazumoda must reach out into the spirit world. He is entering his trance. I call to you. I order you to come. Spirits, obey the command of Mazumoda. <laughs> Feel a presence, all-seeing one. There 
is one here who demands to speak. Then let him speak. Mother, mother, where are you? It's Kenneth. He's calling to me. You may speak to him. Oh, Kenneth, darling, I miss you terribly. Are, are, are you happy? I am happy, mother. Oh, oh, I'm so alone, darling. I want you with me always. I, I, I have felt your presence near me. I have been with you from the moment of my death. It has been difficult reaching you. Difficult to let you hear my voice. Oh. Now you are being helped by kind and gentle people. Be good to them, Mother. Without them, our thin thread of contact will dissolve. Oh. I will return to you and we will talk again. I will return. What happened? Why is he gone? Oh, call him back, call him back, I beg you. Mother Motor, I will give you anything you want, but please let me speak to him again. Now stop that. You want to ruin everything? Stop, I say. The seance is at an end. Oh, oh please, please. Ask Mother Modar to forgive me for my outburst. Mother Modar understands, Mrs. Mowbray. Oh, I hope he does. When may I come again? I will call you after I consult with him. I... I want to... Well, I don't quite know how to say this, but can I give him something? I mean, will he accept? The all-seeing one is a holy man and may not accept money. It is unclean. Oh, oh well, in that case... But he must live, and I must live. That is, I will accept for him. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, here. Oh. You are a good person, Mrs. Gillis. I am I'm so lucky to have found you. Goodbye. Thank you again, and please call me soon. Soon. Goodbye. Archie? She's gone finally, huh? <laughs> Yeah, you didn't let the seance go too long, did you? Uh, just long enough to make her want more. <laughs> it was a complete success. Mazumoda was perfect. She loosened up the purse strings a wee bit, too, didn't she? I heard her say something about money. <laughs> yeah, 500. Take your cut. 500? Oh, better than I thought. Peanuts. That's just a down payment on what she's going to give us. Beg us to take. You got something big on your mind? Yeah. And next time, she's not going to be taken in quite so much by the atmosphere of the seance. She'll want something more definite, more tangible. Well, we got all that info we collected from the Army files about her son. You know, flyer shot down. <laughs> Body never recovered. Final report of his burial in enemy territory. Oh, nothing in that stuff will have any influence on her. Now just take a look at this snapshot taken with his buddies overseas. Take a good look at it. Eh? All right. Yeah, well, what's so important about this photo? Look at his right wrist. What do you see? Here, here, use this magnifying glass. Here. Uh, yeah. Looks like he's wearing one of them identity bracelets his guys wore at the time. You know, especially the flyers. That's correct. Now, it was specially made for him, she told me, by a fancy jeweler. Now, at the time of his death, it was destroyed or stolen. She never got it back. So what? <laughs> Oh, we are going to reproduce that bracelet. And at the next seance, Mazumodar will ask the dear departed Kenneth for some proof that he is really Mrs. Mowbray's son. <laughs> and then old Mazumi will drop the identity bracelet right into Mrs. Mowbray's sweating hands. Oh, oh, oh that's great. That's really a great idea, Frederica girl. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, look, you take this photo and blow it up as large as you can. And then blow up the portion that takes in the right wrist. Uh, yeah, then blow that up again. Yeah. Then get all the details. And huh? then we find a jeweler who can reproduce the identification bracelet exactly. Uh, what do you think that'll be worth to the rich Mrs. Mowbray? <laughs> now I open up, Kent. 
Yeah, would you be a good guy? Good guy now. Open up the door, huh? Look, I got to get in there, Kent. Now, I got all my photographic equipment in there. Ah, well, thanks, old man. Hey, I'm, uh, I'm sorry if I disturbed you. It won't no. take me a minute. No. No, 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 what, no. no, no wait a minute, Kent. Or, uh, no. Or, or, or whatever your name. Now, listen. No. Now, stop. Stop. Now, don't look at no. me like that. Federica. No. Federica, help. Six. No. Five. No, no. Three. Stop. Listen no. to me. No, stop. Federica. To help. me. Help. No. Ah! Now, you hear me? You hear me and you obey? Tell me that you hear me. I hear you. Uh. Well, now go back into your room and stay there until I order you to leave. Repeat what I have said. Go back to my room. Stay there. Until I order you to leave. Until you order me to leave. Feeling better, Archie? <clears throat> well, my throat feels <coughs> like a horse stepped out of something. <coughs> For playing with dynamite. Now, the best thing we can do is turn him in before we all wake up dead some morning. Huh? Yeah. <clears throat> Wait till we make the big caper. So the next seance, when we're able to drop the identification bracelet into the center of the table. Yeah, can, can we take the chance? Can, can we wait that long? Look, just go to work. Take your pictures. How long will it take to have the bracelet made? Well, I know a guy who does great work. Good. Then you get to him. He's just a telephone call away. He owes me a couple of favors. Well, call him. <clears throat> and then start working with your camera. I got all your equipment out of Mazumodar's room. <laughs> Here. <laughs> Feast your eyes on that. Oh, the bracelet. You got it. Told you the jeweler was a friend, huh? <laughs> Did it in two days. Now, ain't it beautiful? Oh, oh, oh let me see the photo. <laughs> the the blow-up you made. Here. Spit an image. Oh, perfect. Looks like the original. Yeah. <laughs> look how he made it look as though it had been in a fire, eh? Marbury went down in flames, you know. Yeah. Oh, good touch. Makes it look authentic. Look, I'll call Mrs. Mowbray and set up the seance as soon as possible. Hey, listen, there's one little fly in the ointment, Freddy girl. What? Maybe we ought to get a new medium to run the show, huh? What are you talking about, new medium? No, no. We've got to use Mazumoda. We've established him. Well, you got to unestablish him. He's gone. Gone? When? How? We'll just have to find him. Come on. He didn't have much money, so he couldn't have gone far. Well, wouldn't it be better to report the whole thing to the police? And throw away enough money to keep us in the good things for the rest of our life? Are you crazy? But now... No, no buts. Mazel Modar is the key that will unlock Mrs. Mowbray's bank account. And we're not going to let that slip out of our hands. <laughs> Hatcher loose in the city again. No one to control his homicidal urges. His changed appearance would make it difficult for the police to recognize and to apprehend him. Will they? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago. days have gone by since Kent Hatcher broke through the bonds of hypnotic suggestion and fled from the house of Frederica Gillis. Mrs. Gillis and Archie have been hunting for him for hours. But the tortured man wanders through the big city. Something urges him onward. Something that he cannot define even to himself. Hello. May I speak to Carl Shearson, please? This is his wife. Carl... Alma, I know you don't like me calling the office, but I, I think I saw him. No, Carl, I'm sure. He's changed, but I knew him. Yes, I, I know I said that before, but this time he followed me. Yes, I tried to get away. I ran into Fletcher's grocery store, quickly ordered some groceries and asked them to let me slip out the back entrance. I, di I didn't see him after that. Call the police. 
No, I couldn't. They... They'll kill him. They're searching for him and they'll take no chance. Oh, someone at the door. Must be my grocery order. I told them to send it up. Call me back in a few minutes, Carl. Coming. Oh, no. No. Please. Please. Don't come in here. Get your foot out of the door. Let me close it, please. Alma. I want to talk to you. Alma, don't. Hold the door. I I won't hurt you. Come. Come in. Alma, I've been following you. At first, I didn't know why. And, and then the name Alma, Alma, kept repeating in my head. And then I knew who Alma was. Do you know who I am? Yes. I know you can't. They told me you were dead. I was alone all those years. I... I'm remarried. Remarried? You were declared legally dead. Even then I hesitated, but Carl insisted that we marry. He's a good man, kind. I need him. He loves me. Our daughter, Mary, dead, isn't she? Pneumonia. The year after you disappeared. Dead. Everything dead or gone or over. Kent, you, you must go away. Hide. They're, they're looking for you. They may find you here. All over. You know, Alma, I can hardly remember what you used to look like. I can hardly remember my life. There's nothing here in the papers. Nothing on the radio or TV. All it says is... Fugitive killer still at large. <laughs> Seems he ran into his ex-missus and her new husband reported it to the police. Well, that means he's still in town. Yeah, worse luck. I wish he'd take off at the great open spaces. I hope we never see him again. What are you talking about, Archie? We need him. I'm hoping he'll come back here. Here? Yeah, where else can he go? He hasn't a cent. He knows he's safe here. Question is, Freddy, are we? I can control him, and we need him. I stalled Mrs. Mowbray twice. I can't keep doing it without her losing interest. If he walked in that door today, we could schedule the seance for tonight and it... <gasps> Clear out of here, Archie. That's a client wants a reading. I'll go in the kitchen. All right, right, right. Call me if you want. Yeah. You, Mazumoto. Oh, come in, come in. Archie, come here. What is it? What? Why, it's him. He was right. He did come back. Mazumoda, listen to me. Listen. You are to go to your room. Go to my room. You will change your street clothes to Mazumoda's robe and turban. Do you understand? I understand. Now... Go to your room. Go. I go to my room. <sighs> it's amazing. That's truly amazing. You got him like a monkey on a string. I told you I could control him. You gonna pull it off tonight? Why should we wait? As soon as we get her money, we'll get rid of him and turn him in. Right, it's my sentiments exactly. Now, he is too hot to handle. The sooner the cops get him, the better. Yeah, hand me the phone. Mowbray, right on time. Come in. Come in. Thank you for calling me. I began to think that all contact with my son Kenneth was broken. I, I thought perhaps I had disturbed Mazumoda by my outburst. Oh, no, no. Nothing like that. But I must tell you, 
His efforts on your behalf have taken their toll of his strength. I don't quite understand. Well, every night, Mazumoda has reached out into the darkness of death to touch the spirit of your son. Oh, has he, has he really? The effort has drained his strength. He, he is not well. Oh, well, then perhaps it may take him months, perhaps years to recuperate. And the expenses incurred are very high. I will pay them anything. Well, I am certain that he will be successful tonight. I have been in communion with the spirit of your son. I have informed him that he must appear to you and must give you some evidence known only to the two of you to prove without any doubt that it is truly he. Oh, if he could, if he could. We will begin. Sit here at this table, as we did the last time. Yes. You there, I across from you, and Mazumoda sitting between us. Yes. Now I will dim the lights. Let us join hands and complete the mystic circle. Oh, Mazumoda, do you feel a presence? I feel there is one here who has traveled a long way. Do you know him by name? This is not simple. He is crying. He is crying. Trying to... Mazumoda, are you all right? Can you continue? I can continue. I must. The spirit is here in our midst. He wants to speak. Let him speak. Mother! Mother, I call out to you across the long reaches of infinity. Oh, oh. I have spoken several times to this holy man who has made it possible to be near you. Yes, yes, Kenneth. He has informed me that I must give you substantial proof of my presence here. What should it be? Oh, anything. Anything. I believe it is really you. No, I will give you proof. Proof of my love for you, dear mother. Do you remember your loving gift to me? What what gift? Shortly before I left to go overseas on my last furlough home. Uh, uh, the bracelet, the identification bracelet. Yes, it, that... was, it was never found, never returned to me. I wanted that more than anything else. I knew that, and I return it to you now. Uh, uh, oh, it's his, his bracelet. Oh, my son, my son. Lights, let us turn on the lights. The seance uh, is over. Come in. Oh, 
Oh, yes, yes, Colonel Plant. I've, uh, I've been expecting you. Yes, yes. Official identification of the body, I know. Well, I don't make the rules. I realize that, Doctor. Let's get on with it. I have another appointment. Very well. If you'll come this way. After you, Colonel. We, uh, keep the bodies here prior to identification. Mm, of course. Right this way, please. And here we are, number 31416. Do you identify this man, Colonel Plant? I do. His name was Kent Hatcher, his serial number. No, no, that won't be necessary, Colonel. It's all here on this form. May I have your signature, please? Uh, yes, of course. Mm-hmm. There you are. Thank you. Is that all? No, that's all that's required officially, Colonel. But do you mind if I ask you a question? Yes, go ahead. That business with the identification bracelet? Oh, it was a fake, a reproduction. Mrs. Gillis' accomplice, Archie, had it made from a photograph. We got all that in their confessions. They had made it look as though the dead son, Kenneth, had sent the bracelet to his mother from the great beyond? Mm-hmm. Yes, it's a common trick played by people of this type to build naive women. <sighs> However, there was one aspect of the matter that has not been satisfactorily explained. You mean about the inscription on the inside of the identification band? To my son, forever and ever, mother. Mm. Doctor, there was no way they could have known what that was or whether there was even an inscription. In some mysterious way, that engraving appeared on the inner face of the silver bracelet. How? We shall never know. And the tortured, troubled man finally found his rest on a cold slab in the morgue. Unmourned, unwanted, unwept for. I'll be back shortly. So we've had a look at the terrifying results of tampering with the human brain. All the experts agreed pretty much on the methods that had been used. But not one had an answer for Kent Hatcher's mysterious extrasensory knowledge of the inscription on the inside of the bracelet. That he took to his grave. Our cast included William Redfield, Bryna Rayburn, Mason Adams, Earl Hammond, and Martha Greenhouse. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. You see this writing? Yes. It is the runic alphabet. It represents an ancient death curse. And and those uh, figures on it? The date of your death. Oh, that's ridiculous. It has earned the reputation of being one of the most powerful of all the ancient spells. The drawback, of course, was the absolute necessity of having the man or woman casting the runes to pass the curse on directly and have it accepted. Oh, no, I won't believe that. This is the 20th century. Careful, careful. Lose this paper and you lose your only chance. You mean there's something I can do? One thing. What is it? Pass the curse to someone else. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams...
I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to a chilling insight into the powers of witchcraft and an ancient curse. Witchcraft today is an in thing with the young, which may appear somewhat incongruous since witches, demons, and warlocks are older than the beginning of recorded time. And somehow, despite all of society's maledictions and efforts to stamp it out, witchcraft has survived, as we will demonstrate in our spine-tingling tale. Do you believe in demons, Miss Bell? Frankly, no. Do you believe in God? Any God? Of course. Then you must also believe in angels. And demons, according to all we know about them, they are simply fallen angels, fixed eternally in evil. And although we may not know whether we are being fanned by airs from heaven or blasts from hell, it is best to be on guard. And having said that, I should not like to be Robert Anthony, whom you will meet very soon. <laughs> mystery drama, This Will Kill You, was written especially for the Radio Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Norman Rose and Larry Haynes. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. one of the curses of mankind. Rage thickens the blood, assails the eardrums, racks the body with a mad urge to destroy. It has been said that whom the gods would destroy, they first make mad, and that applies to all of us, even if some are on speaking terms with God or the devil. Witness a man who is consumed with rage, Theodore Rakatsi. Honestly, you couldn't have heard me come in here. What are you breaking things for? Are you thinking of redecorating? Uh, this is the wrong time to try to be amusing, Liz. Well, what should I do? Ask if you've gone crazy? Evidently, you have not read this, this filthy, ignorant, arrogant, vicious review of my book. Oh, of course I have. That. That presumptuous idiot, Robert Anthony, to write such a review. Oh, come off it, Ted. Uh, <laughs> you know, you sound like you're back to the Middle Ages. What are you going to do? Challenge him to a duel? Uh, I have other powers. Other resources. Well, you're serious. Serious? After this review, let me read just one part to you. Mr. Ragotzi, possessor of an awesome reputation as an expert on witchcraft in this unnecessarily long book titled Demons and Demonology, has gathered the wildest concoction of old wives' tales, superstitions, and demons ever brought before the public. And, what is worse, he has given credence to them. To take witchcraft as seriously as Mr. Ragazzi does is simply childish. Ted, uh, he's just another writer-reviewer trying to be clever. Yes, at my expense. At anybody's expense. He just happened to be the target of the day. Mm -hmm. And now he is my target. For what? A nasty letter to the editor? For... for death. Oh, sure. If you thought this review was bad, wait until you see the ones you get after you kill him. Uh, I will not kill him. Oh, that's a relief. Uh, Liz, uh, pick a date. What? Uh, pick a date. Any date that comes to your mind. Uh, and the time. Uh, write them down on this slip of paper. What for? Oh, to please me. All right. What's today? The 14th. Here. Okay, will this do? The 28th. 10.53 p.m. <laughs> yes, it will do beautifully. Uh, thank you, Liz. You're welcome. And now that we finish finished playing games, can we go? Of course. But the game is just about to begin. I ever remarked how well you drive, Liz? Often, thank you. I think that's what attracted me to you in the first place. 
your driving uh, and your legs. <laughs> I'm happy to see that you're feeling better. Yes. Do to you as usual. Well, I haven't done a thing. Oh, yes, you have. Uh, you know that date you wrote down for me? Yes. Well, that is the exact date and time that Robert Anthony will die. Oh, sorry I asked. You don't believe me? Oh, I thought you'd forgotten about that silly review. Where are you going? To the party. Ted, why did you ask me to write down the date? Oh, a whim. It amused me to leave the amount of time that Anthony has left to live uh, to mere chance. Well, suppose I'd pick a date next year. Well, that would have given Anthony more time. That's all. You sound so certain. <laughs> I am. What's the matter with me? Why am I talking as if there were any possibility that you have the power to kill another human being? Why, indeed. I can almost understand why Anthony wrote about your book the way he did. And of course. Like Mr. Anthony, you also are a dabbler in the occult. Like him, you are an innocent, naive, playing like children with forces you neither understand nor respect. How about a bet? On what? On me and my powers against Robert Anthony. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Oh, yes, you're afraid to trust your skepticism. It's very simply proven. If Anthony dies on the day and at the exact time we both know, then I win. If he doesn't, you are the victor. And you know once and for all that Theodore Cozzi is a fraud and a cheat. That part tempts me. Then I have your word. It is a bet. What are we betting? Your soul. Robert Anthony, you're not leaving the party already. Oh, I'm sorry, Carl. I uh, just dropped by to meet your guests, but my publishers are getting uptight about my new book. Well, everyone here is talking about the hatchet job you did on Ricazzi. Well, why do they think I've got a bone to pick with Ricazzi? Well, I've read a lot of reviews, but... Look, I had a job to do, to review a book. I never even met the man. I took off because his book was so, so ponderous. Instead of writing a history of demons and demonology, which would be interesting, Rakatsi wrote as if he were putting down facts. Oh, sorry if I touched a nerve. It's all right, forget it. I just think there's entirely too much fuss about the review. I know a little about witchcraft, and I think it can be amusing, but... Okay, but I hear Rakatsi's taking it very big. Well, I don't want to hear that Rakatsi's out to get me with the same crazy, demonic, curse superstitious idiots believe in. Well, let's forget, Rakatsi. What about that play we cooked up? Well, I just told you, Carl, my publishers are getting restless. I'm spending most of my time in the library. <laughs> Look, can we put it off for a week or two? Okay, fine. I've got to run. But I'll call, Carl. Just to let you know I'm still alive. This is Jennifer Bell and another broadcast of The Author Speaks. My guest for today is the man who has written the most controversial book about devils and deviltry, Theodore Rokotsi. I am happy to be here. Mr. Rokotsi. I must confess, your book scared the daylights out of me. <laughs> was that your intention? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, my intention was to inform, uh, to let people know that there are forces in this world that they may not have been aware of. Oh, well, then you're serious in your thesis about demons and their power. Oh, absolutely. Which naturally leads me to that review by Robert Anthony. How did you feel about it? Well, I would be less than honest if I said I was pleased. But uh, it caused me only a small annoyance. Really? Uh, you are asking the wrong question. Oh? Well, then set me straight. You should not ask if I were annoyed about it, but rather how Uziel Rabdas Bellet are angry about their powers uh, being mocked. Well, I'm not acquainted with those gentlemen you mentioned. Uh, which is just as well for you. You see, they are demons. Powerful demons. And if they take offense, well, I, I should not like to be uh, Mr. Robert Anthony. You're predicting that some harm might come to Robert Anthony? Well, I predict nothing. Forgive me, but didn't you just issue a warning? 
A warning is not a prediction. Uh, do you believe in demons, Miss Bell? Frankly, no. Do you believe in God? Any God? Of course. Good. Then, of course, you must believe in angels. And demons, according to all we know about them, are simply fallen angels, turned away from God, fixed eternally in evil. I would like to inform you, madam, that a belief in the existence of angels and demons is an article of faith with two of our major world religions. All I say is that I should not like to be in the company of Robert Anthony uh, during the next month. Good morning. I see you have my books waiting for me, those five over there. Thank you. Well, today I ought to finish my research. I'm going to miss the peace and quiet of this library. Uh, my name is Theodore Rakotsi. Uh, I called about a book you said you would have waiting. Ah, yes. Thank you. Oh, excuse me. Yes? It uh, sounds absurd, I know, but uh, I am superstitious about where I sit uh, when I work here. Also, the light. Oh, yes, yes, it's okay. Sit right down. Oh, yes, you, you're so kind. Oh, oh I'm so sorry. Oh, forgive my clumsiness. I've knocked your books down. Let me help you. Oh, it's all right. I can pick them up. Uh, I cannot think how I could be so clumsy. Uh, maybe I should wear glasses. Uh, don't worry about it. Accidents happen. Yes, of course. Oh, uh, uh, this uh, piece of paper is yours, I believe? Oh, thank you. Something wrong? Uh, you keep looking over your shoulder. No, no, no. It's it's uh, it's nothing. I I don't feel well. It'll pass. Ah, oh, yes, of course. Uh, uh, sir, can I? Hello. No, I uh, think I need a little fresh air. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, sir, uh, sir, your books. Oh, forget them. Uh, I'll be back when I feel better. <laughs> Nothing. That's better. Get some control. What's the matter with me? Why do I feel I'm being followed? Bob! Bob! Oh, oh Carl, Carl, I, uh... uh What's with you? Trying to get yourself killed? I, I guess it looked like it, didn't it? Well, no, it's, it's nothing. Carl, believe me, I, I, uh... I was in the library and suddenly I had a crazy impulse to start running. Bob, what's the trouble? Nothing, nothing. There's no trouble. It's it's just that, uh... What do you expect to find over your shoulder? Nothing, nothing. <gasps> if I didn't know that your last novel sold over a million, I'd say you'd just held up a bank and were running away. Look, forget the jokes, huh? But, I'm Bob... sorry, I'm sorry. I really am, Carl. But leave me alone. <laughs> gods would destroy, they first make mad. But are the gods desirous of destroying Robert Anthony or the demons? And who are the demons that are driving him? I'll be back shortly with Act Two. back to lead you along the dark roads of witchcraft. The demon-ridden Robert Anthony has turned to the 20th century remedy against magical spells, psychiatry, and is attempting to explain his terror to an eminent psychiatrist. How can I make you understand, Doctor, how intensely real this fear is? I'm not imagining it. It's there. I feel it. Every minute I feel it. It's... It's at my shoulder, behind my back, pa pressing in on me. Of course. Have you ever heard of anything like this before? Nothing exactly similar, but fear is quite common. Most people are afraid of something. But don't they know what they're afraid of? They sometimes think they do. And what do you tell them? I think it would be best if you talk about yourself. You say you first felt this way about a week ago. Yes, yes, I will. I was working in the library, and I suddenly felt I just had to get out and run. 
Had anything happened that day to upset you? Anything out of the ordinary? No, no, nothing, nothing, Doctor. Have you felt this fear before? I mean, early in your life. Well, just the usual, Doctor, you know, when my friends would dare me to jump over a large hole in the ground or something like that, but... Wait. Yes? Yes, I just remember it. Well, when I went to college, there was a suspension bridge, a shortcut from the campus to my dormitory. Everyone mm -hmm. took it. Mm -hmm. Well, one night I was with some friends, and we came to the bridge, and it, it was out. There, there was only one single plank, and this was a, a, a deep, deep chasm, Doctor, maybe a hundred feet. Yes. Well, I, I wanted to go back to walk around it, but the others voted against that. They, they all walked across. And I can remember how terrified I was. I, I got down on my hands and knees and crawled across the single plank with the water roaring below me. I was terrified. You're afraid of heights. Well, I'm not comfortable with them, but... Would you say that today you're somewhere near the height of your profession as a writer? Oh, come on, Doctor. This has nothing to do with any fear of heights. This, this is... Well, this is... Yes? This is witchcraft. Interesting. Why do you say that? Look, we've been through it. The review you wrote on the Rakatsi book, Demons and Demonology? Right. Are you sorry you wrote such a scathing review? No. No? Well, I... I don't know. I think you are. Well, if I, if I was wrong and possibly there are such demons and spells as Rakatsi describes in his book, that would or might account for this fear of mine, wouldn't it? You mean you think Rakatsi might have put a spell on you? Well, it's possible, isn't it? <sighs> Can't you think of another explanation? Can you? Yes. Let's examine... What you've told me. On the one hand, you believe that Rakatsi has put some sort of a spell on you. Am I correct? That's all I can think of, Doctor. Why would he do that? Well, because he... Exactly. Because you have hurt him severely. So your statement that he wasn't injured by your review is false, isn't it? Well, or illogical. All right, it would seem so. Very well. You admit that to yourself. And then think that, as a sensitive man, you've satisfied your own ego with a review that you think might be unfair. Where does that take us? Doctor, do you believe that I feel so guilty that I run through the streets pursued by shadows? That I can't sleep because I, I feel a presence in my room? That I feel threatened every second of the day and it's getting worse by the minute? Do you really believe that? It's a possibility. Oh, no, no. You'd rather believe in witchcraft. Why? Doctor, you're not helping me. If you'll examine your motive as to why you insist that Rakatsi has some power to cast a spell over you, then I All think... All right, I'm getting out of here. That won't help. Neither do you. I tell you, I feel that I'm going to die, and you talk about guilt? I'm getting out. Desperate men take desperate measures. And Robert Anthony was desperate. As he ran from what he thought pursued him, he held on to the last of his sanity. In his dabbling in witchcraft, he had heard, as had everyone interested in diabolism, of Professor Thurman Anderson, an outstanding scholar and acknowledged authority in the field. Professor Anderson? He is. I'm Robert Anthony. Oh, come in. I've been expecting you. You have? Why? Because I read your review and I know Rakotsi. Oh, then you think he might have done something to me? I think it probable that he has tried. I won't know until you tell me what's happened. Uh, come in and sit down. Thank you. Professor, yes, do, you, uh, do you think you can help? First, tell me why you think Rakotsi has cast a spell. Because as I sit here talking to you, I'm eaten up by fear. I have a feeling that something is following me, Professor. Something, something so terrible that I can't even imagine what it is. But I'm certain, I'm certain that it's going to kill me. Uh, how long have you had this feeling? About a week. And can you remember when you first felt it? Oh, yes, very vividly. It was in the library. I, Do I... you know Rakotsi? No. No spell can be put upon you unless the creator has some contact with you. Did you meet him by chance, perhaps? Well, I don't know. No, I don't think so. I, I haven't been very social this past week. I can't even begin to think what it could be 
Unless you give me something to go on. Did you have a chance encounter with anyone? Did a stranger bump into you, perhaps? No, no, I... I, I... Oh, wait, wait. Yes? In the library, there, there was a man, a man with a, a slight accent. Rickard, she has an accent. Well, I remember he came over and asked if he could sit next to me, and as he sat down, he knocked over my books. He, ah. he apologized... And he insisted on picking them up. Anything else? No. Yes, yes. Yes, he gave me a piece of paper. You took it? Well, of course. I, I, I didn't remember whether I had actually dropped it or not. Uh, do you have it? Well, yes, because I remember looking at it when I got home and wondering what it was. It just didn't make any sense to me. Well, 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 can I see it? Well, sure. There you are. Mm. Good Lord. What is it, Professor? What do you see? Casting of the runes. What? What does that mean? I can't believe that even a man as vindictive as Rakotsi would do this. Professor, what is it? You see this writing? Yes. It is the runic alphabet. It represents an ancient death curse. And, uh, and those uh, figures on it? The date of your death. Oh, that's ridiculous. It was used many centuries ago. There are stories of younger brothers using it to eliminate the rightful heir to the throne. It has earned the reputation of being one of the most powerful of all the ancient spells. The drawback, of course, was the absolute necessity of having the man or woman casting the runes to pass the curse on directly and... Have it accepted. Oh, no, I won't believe that. This is the 20th century. Professor. Careful, careful. Lose this paper and you lose your only chance. Chance? You mean there's something I can do? One thing. What is it? Pass the curse to someone else. Oh, this is unbelievable. If someone else told me about this conversation, I'd say we were both fit subjects for an insane asylum. <laughs> oh, no, I can't go on this way. Professor, how do I go about passing this on? You have someone in mind. Do I have to know a person? No, you could pass it to a stranger. Well, how? Simply brush up against someone in the street or on a bus or subway. See that he drops something. Then pick it up. And along with the package, you pass this piece of paper saying, uh, I believe this is yours. When they accept it, they have it. And you are rid of it. Oh, no, I couldn't do that to anybody. I just couldn't. Why not? If you don't believe in the curse. I don't know about the curse. I can't believe that it will actually kill anyone, but I know how I feel. That's, that is very real and horrible. Well? How, mu how much time do I have? Today is the 23rd. The date here is the 28th. 10.53 p.m. <sighs> There's not a lot of time, is there? Plenty, if you start to pass it now. No, I just can't, Professor. I, I wouldn't give this to my worst enemy, let alone... Hold it, hold it. How about Rakatsi? <laughs> I wondered how long you would take before you got around to that. Yes, of course. I'll pass it back to him. Uh, how? Well, I'll just... Uh... <laughs> exactly. Rakatsi obviously knows you. He is going to be on his guard. Well, can, can someone else pass it? No. It must be passed directly. There must be a way. Hello? Liz, Bob Anthony. Oh. Liz, I must see you. I don't understand. Well, I hate to sound like an old-fashioned melodrama, but it really is a matter of life and death. All right. Where shall we meet? Uh, someplace where we can talk. How about, uh, Shetty's? Oh, I don't think we should be seen together. Well, that's not the kind of talk I had in mind, Liz. I know. I still don't think we should be seen together. You... You know? How? How about the cafeteria at the zoo? Yeah, okay, but Liz... Half an hour. Okay, see you. <laughs> Oh, you're not 
out. I'm early. What would you like? Oh, just coffee. All right, I'll get it for you. No, no, I really don't want anything. Why did you call me? Liz, you wouldn't be surprised and go all girlish on me if I tell you it's because of your relationship with Rakati. No. Okay. Uh, this is going to sound crazy. Well, try me. Liz, I have to know everything you know about Rakatsi. Not personal things, but his schedule, his plans, that sort of thing. Oh. It's, it's terribly important, Liz. Yes. You're not going to ask me why? No. When I said it was a matter of life and death, I meant that. You'll have to believe me, Liz. Well, I do. You're, you're entitled to an explanation. And, and... You do? Yes. You know, I'm making a fool of myself. I'm talking to the wrong person. I, I just never even considered for a moment that you'd be in it with him. I'm not. But you know, you know what I'm talking about. Yes. Well, how? I'd rather not discuss it. Well, you've got to, Liz. Don't you see that? Isn't it enough for you to know that I realize you're in trouble and I want to help? All right, now it's my turn to ask why. No comment. But, Liz... You're wasting time in arguing. What can I do? I've already told you... But don't you see that I'll feel better if... If you can trust me. Yes, exactly. This isn't just fun and games for me, Liz. It's... It's... it's your life. Then you are in on it, huh? Look. I know about it. I'm involved. But I have as much to lose as you. Maybe more. And that's all I'm going to say. Do you think he can do it? More important, what makes you think he can? Everything I know tells me he cannot. But everything I know, everything I've learned, everything that science says doesn't help stop the terrible feeling I have that something, something is after me, Liz. It's, it's just waiting, waiting until it has... 10.53 p.m. on the 28th. That's the date. What makes you think I can help? I have... One chance to break whatever spell Rakatsi has put on me. And what's that? It's just a slim chance, Liz, but a chance. Just take my word for that. If you do want to help, get me the information I want and need. I'll try. How do I reach you? Here. This number. Mm -hmm. Any time, day or night. If I'm not there, I'll get back to you in five minutes. I'll try. Thanks, thanks. And Liz. Yes? We haven't got much time. Time is running out on Robert Anthony. Whatever it is that's following him, or what he honestly believes to be following him, has a target date. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Let us get back with Robert Anthony under a spell and convinced that he has now only 24 hours to live. The date set for his death is 10.53 p.m. on the 28th, and it is now the afternoon of the 27th, and Theodore Rakatsi has a visitor. Liz, come in, my dear, come in. I took the chance that you'd be home. Yes, and I am, and I'm delighted. Of course, I shan't be home for long. As you can see, my bags are all packed. Where are you going? Uh, to my little hideaway up in Purvis. Uh, you remember it? Of course. As a matter of fact, your dropping in might be called providential. I was going to call you to ask you to drive me. When are you leaving? Tomorrow night, uh, fairly early. I uh, think it would be wise for me to be out of the city when Anthony meets the demons. Oh, call it off, Ted. I beg your pardon? I'm asking you to call it off. Call what off, dear Liz? You're much too modern and liberated a young woman actually to believe in demons. Or even more fantastic, that, uh, that I can control them. Don't fence with me, Ted. Call it off. I wonder if I talked with Anthony today, would he write the same review of my book all over again? Or uh, would he have a more open mind? Why don't you ask him? Well, I would like to. I would very much like to, but, uh, well, it's not practical. Uh, by the way, you haven't said you would drive me up to Purdy's. I cannot. I'm sorry. Ted, I, I really cannot. want... Cannot? 
Liz, have you forgotten our little wager? No. Don't you think you might owe it to me to be with me when we hear the news of Anthony's death? Ted, I'm asking you to call it off. Your bet or... The whole thing. Oh, my dear, I would like to. I would really like to please you. Then... There are others involved. I don't understand. When you call upon these forces for help, you're taking a very serious step. It is understood that you're not indulging a whim. These forces do not like the idea of being used carelessly. They are not to be toyed with. Oh, I'm sure you could do something. It's really amazing how you have come full circle in your belief in my powers. <laughs> Would it help if I said I believe everything you claim? It would be an immeasurable aid to my ego. I mean, would it, would it help change your mind about Anthony? I admire you're not asking to get out of our wager. I sincerely admire you for that. Oh, save your admiration. I'm not asking to be released. I'm telling you that I'm not going through with it. Oh, you disappoint me, Liz. You really do. But I, I don't think you can withdraw. I can do what I want. And I don't want to play this game any longer. You have no choice. But I do. We're talking now about my soul. I don't know whether a person has a soul or uh, not. Take my word for it, Liz. You have a soul. Oh, fine. But it's mine. And I'm not giving it to anyone. You have already committed yourself. To what? To a bet made on the spur of the moment and not in any seriousness. I only made it to keep you happy. Whatever your motives, you made it. I intend to hold you to it. Hold me to what? An oral agreement? In the circles in which I move, it is binding. And I say no. And that is most unwise. Are you threatening me? Of course. I think you should know that I will be powerless to help if you should change your mind. I'll remember that. I advise you to keep it very strongly in mind. And uh, along those lines, you won't change your mind about driving me to Perdis? I can't. Really. Uh -huh. hmm? Then I shall have to take the train. That seems obvious. I'm going to ask another favor. For your own sake, it is necessary that you be with me the day after I have won my wager. I would take it kindly if you would get me a ticket on the 9.30 to Purvis. Ted, I... I... believe there is such a train. And then I'll give you the keys to my car, and you can drive up the following day. What makes you think that... Because of our relationship, I've been extraordinarily patient with you, Liz. Now... You will do me these favors. It uh, may predispose me to have more patience with you on the day my wager is due. Hello? Bob? Oh, Liz, I've been waiting for your call. Do you have anything for me? I don't know whether or not it helps, but he's taking the 9.30 train to Purdy's on the 28th. 9.30, that doesn't give me much time. For what? For what I have to do. Liz, that makes it so close. Are you sure about the train and the time? Positive. I bought the ticket myself. 9.30, huh? Yes. Oh, that's going to be awfully close. Did he give any reason for picking that particular train? Well, first he asked me to drive him up. I said I couldn't. And then he told me to get the train ticket. He said... What? What did he say? Oh, it's not important. Liz, everything is important. What did he say? He said... He wants to be out of town when when it happens. Oh, yeah, sure, that makes sense. Bob? Yes? It, it isn't going to happen, is it? Liz, I'm trying. Do you have, I mean, what, what do you honestly think of your chances? A lot better now than before you called. Is there anything else I can do? Yes, pray for me. And you for me. What? Why? How are you involved? Forget I said that. How can I forget Believe it? Believe me if I tell you that my problem is... Well, it has something to do with you. But I'll be okay if you're okay. Oh, you sound like a book title. Well, at least you can show. I hope it isn't gallows humor. Liz, I've got a lot to do. I have a plan. I don't know whether it'll work, but it's made me feel that I can do something. And I'm going to do it. Good luck. Anthony, I didn't believe it when you called. How can I help you? I need a makeup job. For a TV appearance? No, 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 no. I, 
must be disguised so that even my own mother wouldn't know me. Can you do that? Well, maybe if you tell me what it's for, it might help. No, no, no I can't tell you. You'll have to take my word that it's deadly serious. Oh, well, uh, how long will you need to wear the disguise? Oh, uh, four hours at the outside. How many people do you want to fool? One. A man. Uh-huh. How, uh... How well does he know you? Well, that's hard to say. He's not an intimate friend. In fact, I only met him once, but he knew me then. Uh, yeah, one, one more question. Mm -hmm. How does this guy think of you? Oh, I suppose he sees me as a young, smart aleck. Good, good. So we have to make you old. Uh, step into my parlor. Okay. Aren't you going to lock it? Okay. Uh, sit in that chair over here. Now, relax. You're too tense. I'm sorry. See, now, the hair piece is no problem. Your head and hairline are easy. But uh, the eyes... The eyes? Exactly. With the hair you have, you can't have those alert brown eyes. Uh, let me see. Watery blue with little veins running through them. Ah. Yeah. Okay, now. Ever wear contact lenses? No, of course not. <laughs> You'll love them. <laughs> Slight effort. There. How's your vision? Well, I can see. Good, good. The wrinkles come last, and uh, I think a little goatee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bushy beard wouldn't be right. <laughs> now just put your head back. Grand Central Station in New York City at 9 o'clock of any evening is a dreary place. The waves of homebound commuters have washed away. The garish light serves only to point up the cruel deterioration of past grandeurs. The waiting rooms are almost empty. It was 9.20 exactly that Robert Anthony carrying a small suitcase and disguised as an old man, walked slowly up to the ticket window. Uh, Mount Kisco, one way, please. Anthony walked slowly to the station platform where the 9.30 was about to depart. He wanted to be almost the last one to board the train so that he could locate the car that Rokatsi had selected. He boarded the train and passed through several cars and then his pounding heart slowed. He saw Rokatsi, seated in the middle of the car, and with the seat next to him, vacant. Excuse me, would you mind if I put my valise on the rack? Oh, not at all. Uh, let me help you. Oh, it's very kind. Yeah, yeah. Not at all. Uh, you, you certainly cut that close. I'm afraid I don't walk as quickly as I used to. It's hard to get accustomed to growing old. Yes, I suppose it is. Uh... I hope you'll forgive an old man's curiosity, but that book you're reading... Uh, the dynamics of witchcraft. Yes, yes, that subject has always fascinated me. Uh, did you ever study it? No, no, but uh, when I was younger, Halloween was my favorite holiday. You know, dressing up and trick-or-treating. Yes, I know. Oh, that was such great fun. Uh, yes, yes. No, I, uh, I won't disturb you anymore. I know you're anxious to get on with your eating, but uh, where, where are you getting off? Purvis. Is that before or after Mount Kisco? Uh, uh, I, I wonder. I mean, I have a tendency to drowse off, you know. I wonder if when we reach Mount Kisco, hey, yes, would yes, be I will let you know. <laughs> Is it? Uh, oh, it's yes. the next station. Uh, did you have a nice nap? Oh, yes, yes. Very refreshing. Thank you. I uh, do hope my nephew will be at the station. Yes, I'm sure he will. Oh, what time is it? Uh, 20 past 10. Are we on time? Oh, I don't know. I suppose so, but uh, even if we're running late, I'm sure your nephew will wait. Yes, I hope so. And when you get old, you seem to worry about everything. <laughs> the young have their worries. But they're not the same, are they? <laughs> Sometimes they are. Sometimes a young man can worry himself almost to death. Oh, that seems such a waste. Or even worry about dying. 
joke. <laughs> yes. I have known some young people who are simply terrified of dying. Oh, I didn't think the young gave much thought to death. Oh, some of them do. Some of them do indeed. Uh, take my word for it. That seems strange. Strange? Old man, I could tell you stories that are beyond belief. Stories that... Well, I, I seem to be talking a lot. Well, I enjoy it. Thank you, but uh, we're coming into Mount Kisco. Oh, well, I've enjoyed talking to you. And now I'll just get my luggage for the rack. Oh, oh, oh my. Look what I've done. I've dropped my bag. Uh, here, let me help no, you. No, 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 no. I've caused you too much trouble. I'll be able to... Oh, oh, your book. I just seem to make things worse. If you will let me do it, it will be much simpler. Oh, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But do let me return your book. I believe this is yours. Uh, yes, yes. And now you'd better start if you want to get off and meet your nephew. Yes, yes. Goodbye and thank you. Wait, what? You, you passed it. The paper. Please, let go of me, my nephew. Stop acting. You're Anthony. I know it. Yes, you're right. And I'm getting off here. Not until you tell me where you hid the curse. That paper you passed to me. Miss your train. Damn the train. Where is it? The paper. I'll do anything. But you know how close it is. This very little time. I beg you, please, for the love of God, tell me where you put that paper. It's in the book. I slipped it in the book when I gave it back to you. Book. Book. Where? Where? Oh. Oh, my God. Catch it. Catch it, Anthony. Grab it. No way, Rakosi. Uh, get it yourself. It's blowing away. You know I'm lost if I don't get that paper. Come back. Come back. I'll get you. Rakosi. Look out. The train. of our story of witchcraft and demons. The obituary notice said that Theodore Ricazzi met his death when he inexplicably ran in front of a southbound express at the Mount Kisco station. Inexplicably? I'll be back shortly. I'm sure we all know what the forces were that made Theodore Rakatsi run in front of the train that killed him. He panicked because of a superstitious belief in the supernatural. That, of course, is the explanation. Or is it? Our cast included Norman Rose, Larry Haynes, Evie Juster, Roger DeCoven, and Gil Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. You claim to be an Indian. You talk about fighting and wars. Well, that would be before the white men came to this country. I've never seen men like you and these others. There is one small detail that troubles me. How does it happen you speak English? I don't know. You don't know. I don't know. I was returning to my people. They live near the banks of the Great River. The Great River? The Potomac. Ah. As I told you, something took place in the mist. I awoke. Now, now I'm in a strange place. I find that I can speak the language, but I don't know what anything means. Where is this place? Who are you? I'm your doctor, your friend. My name is Carl Stitzer. And who am I? This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.